So welcome to the Concordia University War Game Design uh, Speaker Series, which we're holding at um, Concordia University, which is the um, university behind me. I'm very happy to have Ambassador Philip Kosnett join us. Uh, he's a designer of a number of games uh, from the uh, 1970s, and he's uh, come back into the industry as a game designer. Uh, we are, uh, this talk is, is uh, funded by the SDS, the uh, Concordia University Political Science Student Association Strategic and Diplomatic Society. And uh, it's a series in which we look at uh, uh, essentially key contributors to uh, war game uh, design um, in the community. Uh, we're very lucky because uh, uh, Ambassador Cosnet is in, in effect a triple threat. Uh, he's uh, both a political scientist, trained as a, as a political scientist uh, at Harvard, uh, he is a war gamer, plus he has designed many war games, uh, including uh, some very notable ones that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, and he had a 38 year career in the State Department. So he has uh, exceptional insights into the uh, into what war gaming uh, can be used for and uh, its shortcomings uh, in terms of um, uh, designs. So I'm going to read through a, uh, a very, very brief uh, biography. This biography was sent out, of course, to um, those that are uh, on my YouTube channel. And the uh, biography is going to be posted on the YouTube channel um, uh, just under the video so it can be uh, read. But I'm going to read certain extracts from it. During a 38-year uh, State Department career, Ambassador Philip Cosnet represented the United States in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, focusing on international security and post-conflict governance and development. He established a record of success as a strategist, negotiator, and leader of interagency and civil military teams in conditions of peace and war. Ambassador Cosnet's senior positions include Ambassador to Kosovo, Charge d'Affaires, Acting Ambassador in Turkey and Iceland, and Deputy Chief of Mission, which is Deputy Ambassador in Uzbekistan. He served four years in Iraq and Afghanistan as a provincial administrator and senior political military officer. Ambassador Kosnet also held political, economic, counterterrorism, and environmental diplomacy portfolios at U.S. missions in Japan and the Netherlands, and served in policy and crisis man uh, management positions in Washington. Among several ongoing writing projects, Ambassador Kosnet is editing the forthcoming volume, Boots and Suits, Historical Cases and Contemporary Lessons in Military Diplomacy for Marine Corps University Press. He's a graduate of Harvard University. Uh, he's also formerly studied the Turkish, Japanese, Dutch, and Russian language, and he is self-taught in Pentagon dialect. Ambassador Cosnet started wargaming about 1968 at the age of eight with Avalon Hill Games and discovered SPI in 1971. In 1975, while in high school in New Jersey, he started writing for SPI's design magazine, Moves, and for other gaming magazines and attending SPI's in-house play testing sessions, aka the Friday Night Follies. His first design credit was actually not for SPI. It was a tactical game, Airborne, for Panther in 1976. Most of his SPI games, starting with Yugoslavia in 1977, were future history titles, including several in the popular contemporary World War III genre. From a design perspective, the most interesting and different of these was War in the Ice, set in Antarctica with an emphasis on logistics and limited intelligence. In War in the Ice, you can detect the origins of his current interest in the non-kinetic elements of operational warfare. Ambassador Cosnet stopped designing SPI when he left uh, uh, to New York for a degree in 1978, uh, but did two science fiction tack armor games, Hell Tank and Hell Tank Destroyer, for metagaming while in college. He joined the U.S. Foreign Service in 1983, and he became inactive as, as, a, as a designer until 2021, when Compass Games contracted him to publish a new alt-history quad, Vengeance and the Fall of the Soviet Union. This is not a straight-up update of Objective Moscow but it does address some of the same themes. Now, just a small extract from the CV, which I just, I, I wanna you know, put a microscope in there uh, for discussion purposes. Uh, ambassador Kosnet was the ambassador to the Republic of Kosovo between 2018 and 2021. He led a 500 person interagency team in this US partner country. He strengthened cooperation in rule of law, anti-corruption, human rights, democratization, counterterrorism, 
peacekeeping and trade investment. He was deputy chief of mission or deputy ambassador and charge d'affaires acting ambassador in Turkey between 2016 and 2018. He headed the, the, the 1100 person five city interagency mission. He preserved US influence, security and mission morale in face of terrorist attacks and tensions with the host government, maintaining foundations for long-term cooperation. He supported humanitarian and security operations in Syria. He negotiated the release of US hostages. He was deputy chief of mission in Uzbekistan from 2011 to 2014. He managed the 400 person mission. This expanded bilateral cooperation on regional security, advanced judicial reform and democratization. It strengthened the foundation for Uzbekistan's opening toward the West. And Ambassador Kosnet was deputy chief of mission challenge d'affaires for Iceland between 2004, 2006, he helped negotiate the closure of Cold War era US Naval Air Station and modernization of the US NATO Iceland defense cooperation. Uh, Ambassador Kosnet has already been interviewed by Compass Games at a link which is, uh, uh, was posted on the, um, the bio I sent out and is also gonna be posted um, at the bottom, the description in the YouTube channel about his early involvement in wargaming and how it helped prepare him uh, for the diplomatic career and how his diplomatic career informed his thinking about war game design. So I strongly recommend people go see that uh, before they see this interview, because we're gonna build uh, on that. I'd now like to share uh, images of the war games in which Ambassador uh, Kosnet uh, participated. I'm gonna go pull this up. Okay, I've got this. One moment while I share screen. So as I understand it, uh, Ambassador Kosnet, you were the developer, but not the actual uh, uh, initial designer for Objective Moscow. Is that, can you guys see the Objective Moscow? Uh, that, that's right, that's right, Julian. Uh, the Objective Moscow was designed by Joe Angelillo and uh, uh, SPI's production system was to bring in a second, uh, a second, research and development staffer to be the developer, to be the editor, to work on scenarios, to flesh out the designer's original ideas. So everything good in Objective Moscow was Joe Angelillo's work and everything bad was the result of my inexperience as a developer. Well, before, I mean, before you, you heap too much guilt on yourself, uh, political science, particularly international relations as a sub-discipline, failed to predict the end of the Cold War. And one of the reasons uh, I, I invited you, uh, in addition to being a war game designer, is as a political scientist, you would appreciate how, how we got the end wrong. Uh, Paul Kennedy, in his book, Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, predicted that the Soviet Union would, would endure as a system until 2030. Uh, and it is, it is surprising uh, that... Uh, George F. Kennan, uh, the, the, I, I guess, the, the vague architect of containment theory, um, anticipated that this would be the end result. I mean, Carl, Carl Deutsch also anticipated it, which is the education of populations and the, the creation of middle classes. So we can at least discuss um, uh, why you got closest, along with, your, your, uh, with, with the, the designer, your, your co-developer, why you got the closest, and everyone else was much uh, farther away. And of course, uh, I, I did go through the rules of the game, uh, and it doesn't have uh, domestic collapse as one of the possibilities. So, you know, something that we can, uh, we can discuss about how we as uh, political scientists can do better analysis. Uh, you designed one of the four sieges in the Art of Siege, which is uh, Acre, of course. Uh, this is a, a a snippet not from Acre, but from one of the other uh, games in the uh, in the Siege series. Uh, then there's the uh, War in the Ice, which I mean, again, I find it uh, uh, absolutely fascinating, and I, I raised uh, some of the uh, issues that uh, design issues or decisions in the game with uh, Troy Buffard at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, uh, specifically uh, on. Uh, are there lessons learned between the Arctic and the Antarctic? Uh, he said no. He said they're very different. It's like comparing a, a a donut hole to a donut, right? Obviously, the Arctic is a donut. There's nothing in the middle, where uh, where the Antarctic is quite different. Um, this is a snapshot of that. 
obviously with climate change, we're going to see huge um, geopolitical changes. I and mean, we can imagine 200 years ago, there were a quarter of a million Californians and, and 400,000 indigenous Californians. And today, if it was independent, it'd be the 10th richest country in the world. So uh, geopolitics can change uh, within two generations dramatically. Of course, this is a game I played, uh, Zagreb, and this is part of the, uh, the quad design that you discuss uh, briefly in your Compass Games uh, interview. So those were some, some of the uh, games uh, uh, that Ambassador Cosnet uh, designed. I highlighted some of them. There's a link again in the bio where you can uh, go to um, Game Board Geeks and look at the full list of the games uh, that were designed. So uh, if I could just uh, uh, reiterate my, my uh, uh, reason for inviting Ambassador uh, Cosnet, I was in uh, the Soviet Union and uh, Uzbekistan as a part of my gra high school graduation gift from my grandmother. She worked at the UN and so I said, I wanna go there. And I got to talk to some with my brother, Russian soldiers heading towards the border. And we got to talk to a lot of young people in Leningrad and Moscow. My, my interest obviously is that if we, can, if we could have better diagnosed what was going on in the Soviet Union, we might be able to use that insight today in understanding what's going on in Russia, Iran and China. And, uh, where democracies were, were essentially on their heel in the 70s and 80s. Today, it's a revolutionary ideology. And uh, you know, we need to understand how to use public diplomacy better to be able to uh, flex that uh, muscle. But that's not the only reason we're, we're here. Um, essentially, we want to know about Ambassador Cosnet's um, uh, design philosophy for wargaming. So Ambassador uh, Cosnet, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this talk. Well, thank you, Jillian. And and by the way, uh, I also answered to Phil, which uh, which may save us a few minutes in the course of uh, of our long day's journey into night here. Uh, so yes, let's talk about war games for a bit, and uh, I will do my best to um, to outline, if if not exactly design philosophy, uh, what I am interested in. Uh, in bringing to the table in war game design, now that I'm returning to the field after after decades away, uh, and I say this knowing that far more accomplished designers like Chuck Camps and Joe Miranda are on the call, and I hope that uh, during the discussion period you guys will uh, will jump in. So, based on my experience as a diplomat and as what the State Department calls a political military officer, somebody who focuses on uh, civilian military cooperation and international security is in how to use war games to provide a sense of the range of challenges that commanders on the battlefield face. Uh, I think that even at the lowest levels of command, commanders can find themselves having to think about much more than how to shoot, move, and communicate. That's certainly true in a counterinsurgency environment, but even when involved in what the U.S. military calls large-scale combat operations, yeah, uh, unless you are conducting those operations uh, in the Western desert or someplace where you weren't really worried about uh, host governments or host populations, the movement of refugees, uh, you're going to have to think about the people who are on the game board. And chances are, and I'll come back to this, uh, in, in a modern environment, you're also going to have to think about how to, how to engage in and cooperate with, uh, how to engage in non-kinetic operations and how to cooperate with civilian agencies. All right. So going back to the 1960s when Avalon Hill uh, invented hobby wargaming, and looking forward into the early 1970s, when SPI came on the scene uh, as Avalon Hill's rival, but uh, also with a business model in which they were pumping out a lot more games. Most of the early games were focused almost exclusively on kinetic operations. Uh, you know, the player uh, was in the role of a commander, you know, pushing his cardboard brigades and divisions and battalions around on the map. If factors like logistics and intelligence and command and control were uh, were part of the game, they were highly abstracted. Uh, 
for the most part, there were no limits on, there were no intelligence rules, no limits on the player's knowledge of the forces arrayed before him. We refer to that as God's eye view. And we could hand wave it, but you know, it, it really was, was, uh, was grotesquely unrealistic. Logistics, uh, typically in the early games, either there no, were no logistics rules, or there was a simple rule that if your units could trace a line of hexagons, you know, back to a friendly map edge or a friendly city without enemy forces intervening, they were considered fully supplied. Uh, some games uh, would have supply units and eventually supply points that attempted to add a little bit more to this. But the fact is that nobody, nobody was interested in buying games that, um, that accurately emphasize logistics. Uh, command and control. In almost all the games, your units would do exactly what you told them to do when you told them to do it. And one of the features of uh, the, the, early, the early classic war games was that combat results were almost always calculated uh, by, by odds. And you know, players would sometimes spend an ungodly amount of time shuffling their units around, looking for that extra strength point, you know, to get uh, a four to one to a five to one or a five to one to a six to one attack. Um, that may have been modeling, you know, something uh, in, the, in the most vague general sense of trying to deploy forces, but it was very fiddly and very gamey. Uh, another element of the uh, absence of command and control rules and combined with the absence of limitations on intelligence was that players usually didn't really bother with maintaining reserves because they, you know, they, they were unlikely to be surprised by anything happening on the battlefield. Political environment pretty much absent. Uh, player actions rarely affected or were affected by political consider considerations. Now, these games were fun. I mean, they were a lot of fun. I you know, played them to death and became a designer. And I learned a lot of history from these games, but I think hobbyists often tended to exaggerate their simulation value. And we mistook detail, what we sometimes called chrome for accuracy. Uh, now I have remembered for almost half a century, a comment by SPI designer Frank Davis uh, in his office one day when he said to me, our, our, our games are classic comic books, not history books. You know? uh, I think that's fairly self-explanatory. The point being that you could learn in, in general terms about historical uh, historical events and the challenges facing commanders but there were there were a lot of gaps in uh, in their historicity and their accuracy now there were exceptions to this and as game output increased in the mid 1970s as more companies joined in some publishers were pushing the envelope so let me let me mention some of the games that um, that I encountered in this, in my wargaming days in the 70s and 80s uh, that demonstrated an effort to, to model some of these elements. Uh, some uh, looking at limited intelligence, um, a tool that uh, was used in some games was to keep units flipped over so you didn't you didn't know who they were until you came into contact with them, and also to use what were sometimes called dummy units, which represented fog of war, or you know, or small patrols, or just in general confusion. Uh, so you didn't know if a piece of cardboard on the map represented a combat unit or just you know, smoke and mirrors. Uh, and I, I personally encountered those for the first time in uh, SPI's Vietnam games, Grunt in 71 and Year of the Rat in 1972. Some of the early naval games, including Midway in 1964, which was very early in, uh, in hobby wargaming, uh, they attempted to limit intelligence uh, by having double maps. You know, uh, each player would deploy his forces on his map with a barrier between them. Uh, 
the the weakness in the early games was the search mechanism. Uh, you ended up doing things like calling out, you know, it, do you have an enemy unit, you know, to your to your opponent, you know, is there a unit in square B12? It was kind of like playing the children's game Battleship. I mean, it was a very abstracted version of uh, of search, but you know, it 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 attempted with some broad success to simulate the headaches that a naval commander had. He knew the enemy was out there someplace, but he didn't know exactly where, and he had only a limited ability to look for them. Uh, interestingly, looking back, there was very little effort by the big war game companies to introduce umpired games, you know, where, uh, we, where you could have had a system where the umpire had all the information about what was going on with both sides' forces, and the other players were in the dark. Uh, I think there was a sense in uh, in Baltimore and New York at Avalon Hill and SPI headquarters that, you know, there weren't all that many war gamers out there to begin with and nobody really wanted to umpire. Uh, I think given the success a couple of years later of Dungeons and Dragons and the role-playing genre, which featured dungeon masters, you know, who, who actually controlled all the gameplay, perhaps we missed the boat there. Perhaps that was a missed opportunity. Uh, another series that attempted to introduce limited intelligence was Game Designers Workshop's Double Blind series in the mid-1980s. They did a game on Normandy and a game on Market Garden where there were two maps and, you know, counters were flipped over and without going into great detail, they attempted to, again, to simulate the fog of war uh, in, by having a system where players would only learn what the opponent's forces uh, represented once they came into contact with them. Logistics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there, was, there were some efforts in this period to model logistics uh, by introducing supply units, in some cases supply points that you might have to burn to launch an attack or to uh, perhaps to double the strength of a normal attack. Uh, that was about as much logistics as most players seemed interested in. Uh, you know, I remember a game from 1975 from the publisher Yogpanther called March on India, which was about the Japanese uh, infall Kohima campaign in Burma. And uh, the guys at Yogpanther, uh, which was a small outfit in Texas, which did a, a lot of uh, unusual things, they pushed the envelope a lot. They had a system where you had to burn, you would establish a line of supply, a lot, lines of communications from your depots to the front. Uh, and the longer the line of supply went, the more points, supply points you had to burn just to maintain the line of communication. And it was something like, you know, the first 10 hexes might have been one supply point per hex. And then it became 1.25 uh, point supply points per hex and 1.5 supply points per hex in the lines of communication. And even in the designer's notes, it said, we know most of you guys aren't going to bother with this. You're going to say it's too fiddly and you're going to ignore it, but that is going to destroy the historicity and the, and the, uh, and the balance of the game, which I thought was rather self-aware. Uh, moving on into the eighties, there were other attempts to introduce more sophisticated ways of showing what operational commanders faced in terms of balancing the need to move to move ahead quickly with the need to maintain their force. I would refer you to the, um, the central front system that SPI introduced in 1980 with a series of games in the popular uh, World War III, you know, uh, NATO Soviet genre. Uh, and the more, and as you move your units uh, if you moved your units too fast, you would suffer strength point losses even before getting into contact. Um, players either loved or hated this. And in fact, when, um, when the Central Front system, after a hiatus, returned in 1988, 1989, with one of SPI's uh, successor publishers, the friction point system had gone away and been replaced by something simpler. Command and control. I mean, there were 
some early efforts to reduce the player's ability to have you know, complete control over his forces. Uh, in operational games, it, this and strategic games, this proved very, rather difficult to model. Uh, one early at effort at this was in 1974 uh, with SPI's first Civil War game, American Civil War, and that had a rule where, uh, and th this was this was a, a very strategic game. Showed you know the map covered all of uh, all of the the Eastern Theater of War. Um, the the player would array forces typically in several hexes for the uh, the uh, Union player, for example, there might have been several hexes around Washington where there were forces deployed. And at the beginning of the movement phase, you rolled this dice, consulted a chart, and those that were, depending on the die roll, those that were in a hex whose four-digit hex identifier ended in one, two, three, four, five, or six um, were stuck and would not move. All right. And there were a lot, this was very gamey and there were lots of ways to game it. And in fact, players figured out that some hexes were more likely uh, to suffer the, this, this paral paralyzing ray than others. Uh, and, you know, and would avoid that. It was a good effort. Like a lot of, um, a lot of games coming out of SPI in those days, uh, a little more testing, a little more time and development might have helped them get ahead of it. But you know they um, they they were they were pushed the envelope in a lot of ways. Some games, and uh, one that comes to mind is France 1940, which was originally published in SPI Strategy and Tactics magazine in 1971, and then republished uh, the next year by Avalon Hill. Uh, had a had a scenario with French idiocy rules, which showed how uh, how French doctrine you know simplified the um the the german offensive i mean that was kind of an interesting artifact the problem with idiocy rules and stand fast rules in games generally was that um if players were uh, if they knew history at all you know they they kind of had a leg up because they know what might work and what might not and uh, players felt very constrained by this it could be a useful history lesson but it got in the way of the gaming all right. Fi finally, I want to talk a little bit about early efforts to uh, to introduce political considerations into wargaming. Um, Operation Olympic was a 1974 SPI game, solitaire game, modeling the uh, the proposed invasion of uh, of southern Japan, and that was the first game that I encountered, and others on the call may ha may have other memories. First one I encountered with a casualty tracker that was tied to national morale. It was inevitable that the Americans were going to achieve their objectives and conquer the island. But uh, the more, you know, uh, every time you fought, uh, the, the combat results table indicated what your casualties were like and you had to track casualties. You know, and eventually if casualties were too high, you would lose because the American people, you know, would have, um, would have suffered a blow to their morale. And there were there are a number of, of subsequent games that played around with that. I have to say one of the most interesting early efforts to model what I would call politics and wargaming was in a tactical game, uh, SPI's Grunt in 1971, which was a squad level game set uh, in Vietnam. The American player was a company commander uh, you know, moving his forces around the jungle, searching for hidden uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese units. The game could be incredibly frustrating uh, in that regard. It probably accurately modeled the the psychological effects on uh, on a company commander in the field. Well, there was um, there was a mechanism in the game where if um, if your your troops came across Vietnamese civilians, you could interrogate them to try to find the location of enemy assets. But if you uh, if you interrogated them too roughly, and this was a factor of a die roll, and you killed some of them, then you would suffer you know, a, 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 a political ill effect from that. Uh, what I was very young when I played this game, I was fascinated by that. And it was an indicator that, you know, that even at a tactical level, 
uh, at least in a counterinsurgency environment, you know, you cannot ignore these political realities. Now, when I was designing in the 1970s, and Julian, thank you for uh, for uh, the memory, the walk down memory lane about with some of my games. Most of the games I was doing as a junior designer for SPI were were quads, uh, like the the Ocker game and the Art of Siege and the Yugoslavia game in the Modern Battle series, where I did not, I was not the auteur. I did not fully control the, um, the, the process. The first project that I owned from idea through um, feedback, which was a process that SPI used to, um, to uh, poll their customers to find out what games were publishable through design and development was War in the Ice. The, and uh, the game you mentioned earlier, you know, an alt history World War III game set in Antarctica with combat be among the Americans, the Russians, and a so-called South American Union ostensibly fighting over energy resources that had been discovered uh, in Antarctica. Now, this was a science fiction game. It was a game game. It was not a simulation, but what I set out to do was to try to model some of the headaches that a commander might face in this environment. Uh, I have to say it was probably, uh, in terms of what I was attempting to accomplish, the most successful game that I designed for SPI, and it still has a bit of a following decades later. Uh, partly because there aren't a whole lot of games out there where you get to play, you know, in Antarctica. I mean, if you want to play Battle of the Bulge, you have literally dozens of games to choose from. Uh, I designed it to resemble an aircraft carrier game with very small task forces maneuvering over a vast expanse to attack enemy bases. There was limited intelligence. There were um, there were dummies, you know, in the in the guise of what we would now call uh, unmanned ground vehicles that you know would would head off into the hinterland and uh, and simulate the uh, econ the uh, electronic uh, emissions of uh, of a larger unit. There was a highly abstracted satellite recon system to do the same thing. Uh, I went crazy with logistics and, you know, we advertised it as a logistics game and got away with publishing it that way. Uh, you are, so a lot of the, uh, the emphasis was on figuring out how to move supply points forward by land or air to support your task forces. And uh, if somebody actually had a battle, you know, it usually happened after several game turns of maneuvering across the ice. And politics was represented through the reinforcement mechanism. You could pay resource points, essentially money, uh, to bring in extra units. You could even uh, engage in deficit spending. Uh, but the if you uh, if you burned through a lot of resource points, you know, you could end up losing the game uh, even if you won on the battlefield, because the whole uh, conceit of War in the Ice was that we had found oil and gas in Antarctica, and we were going to go. And this was, you know, during the uh, during the days of, days of the oil shocks, and we were going to go secure it. And almost inevitably, you would end up uh, spending more money and more oil than you were ever going to pull out of the ground. You know, but uh, that struck struck me as uh, rather realistic because most wars, uh, I would submit, are resource wars that we would be better off not fighting in the first place. Uh, what I didn't really model effectively in, uh, in War in the Ice, and what I would do if I was ever going to take another shot at it, was to limit command and control more. Again, it, it was too easy, and there are probably things I could have introduced in the guise of, say, electronic warfare uh, or today, you know, we talk about hacking, which was not really a term when I did this game back in the 1970s, uh, to limit the ability of forces to operate. I'll take a breath there and see if Julian has any comments. Well, I'd like to, uh, to remind our uh, viewers, um, Professor Miranda, you've joined us, and um, uh, Mr. Denis, you've also, Dennis, you've already also joined us. You, again, um, as with our normal uh, procedures, procedures, you're always 
uh, welcome to just jump in um, with comments. Uh, I, I did want to highlight one game, which was uh, after the Holocaust, which is a rebuilding the U.S. after a nuclear war game, which is entirely logistical. And I had uh, three students spend an entire semester playing that game, and it was it was a horror show. You basically are fending off starvation for three months. And you know, one of the, one of the um, the effects that the designer, I believe, it was Redmond Simonson's game, was um, was aiming for was to punish you for being a would-be Napoleon and you know teach people you could actually do much better trying to rebuild your economy and trade with your neighbors than by building a, up a military and trying to uh, trying to seize wealth from your neighbors i think the game effectively modeled that that's no that is that is precisely uh, the emergent property that we discovered about a month in uh, <laughs> yeah, we were we were severely uh, punished for it um, if there, if not, not any questions, can I? Uh, oh, sorry, you, you have you have more. Um, my my inclination is to ask about um, uh, your you know very interesting insights uh, for uh, Ukraine. Okay, well before we before we get to that, before we move on to that, um, let me talk about games just a little bit more, please. If, okay, so uh, I yeah I I kind of moved away from war gaming. Uh, for for decades other than to um to buy them and and less frequently um play them um and i spent four years in iraq and afghanistan uh between 2004 and uh and 2010 and much of that time i was doing political military work uh one one year i was the state department uh foreign policy advisor polad to the um, to the American Corps commander in Iraq, General Odierno, it, located in his command group, and that was um, you know a tremendously educational experience. I like to think I contributed something. I certainly learned a lot. But one thing that I did learn uh, in that job and in other political military jobs in Iraq and Afghanistan was in a counterinsurgency environment, just how much of uh, of a commander's time and energy, and not just a three-star. I mean, the same was true when we would do battlefield circulation and go down range and talk to battalion and brigade commanders. Was how much of their time was spent not on figuring out, you know, how to uh, how to shoot people or to defend uh, their troops and their bases against insurgents. It was spent on logistics. It was spent on politics, even at a very low level. If you uh, if you include you know the t the cliche winning hearts and minds of the local populace as a political development, uh, a lot of emphasis on economic development and how to incentivize local population you know, to um, to view to view this invading force of space aliens uh, in a positive light and. Uh, this has informed the work I'm doing now. Uh, I am designing a game for Compass. Uh, Compass knew that I was uh, that I was retiring from federal service and approached me to see if I might be interested in working with them. And the first project that uh, we came up with is, uh, and uh, and I know Joe Miranda is here, so I'm going to be very careful in, in explaining this. It is. Uh, not a remake of a game I had worked on back for SPI called Objective Moscow, which was a hypothetical Soviet Union versus everybody war. But it it is uh, it approaches the same themes from a different direction. It's a different scale. It's a different system. It has many different elements in it. No one would mistake these two games, uh, other than that they both deal with a hypothetical war between the Soviet Union and everybody else in the near future. Um, I think there's room for two such games in the universe, just as there is room for thousands and thousands of bulge games. But what I, what I set out to do uh, in this game was to, um, to put the players in the shoes of a geographic combatant commander. And uh, part of the action takes place in Central Asia. Uh, not too many games on Central Asia. I think you can count them on... Uh, one hand that has lost several fingers. Uh, one in uh, one map is, is set in Siberia, 
and then there are uh, there are two maps that uh, that that showcase fighting in uh, in Russia and Ukraine, and those can be those can be joined together. All right, it is fundamentally an old school hex encounter war game where people are moving brigades and divisions around the map. Um, but I attempted to introduce a lot of political factors uh, where not only are political elements offstage affecting what happens on the battlefield, but what happens on the battlefield is affecting political developments uh, in the rear, th what I, through what I'm calling not quite random events, uh, where as the commander, you can, you can influence what happens offstage. Uh, there will be an emphasis on national morale and resilience. And I'm also introducing uh, provincial reconstruction team units. Now, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. and its allies deployed these joint civ mill teams called uh, PRTs or provincial reconstruction teams, basically to try to affect local latitudes, uh, do economic development, uh, you know, try to tilt the local populace towards us and uh you will see these in the game in uh in, and we'll see how much of uh, effect they have a uh, big emphasis on logistics trying to find the sweet spot between being unduly abstract and overly detailed because um yes a core commander worried a lot about logistics but just like he wasn't really moving companies around on a map he also wasn't moving supply convoys around and he had to worry about the air war but he wasn't worried he wasn't moving um squadrons around on the map there are plenty of games like that they're terrific i'm not dissing them um this is not that sort of game it's 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 a, a little more abstracted in uh in those in those areas i'm sorry in the in the compass uh interview you did uh, elaborate that on the the central uh, of one of the four quads in central asia it really is it's a it's a uh, you have multiple actors on the international system meaning the neighboring countries uh mm -hmm. at the same time as you have an insurgency model going on so it's sort of a um uh, I guess an updated anticipation of how things um, uh, were, were going to collapse. And that's not, that was obviously not in the original game. The original game was just a kinetic NATO advancing to Moscow in four different directions. Right. And um, it was, you know, that, that game has a, has a big following uh, to this day. I think what, what really sold objective Moscow was the map I and mean, this beautiful uh, four mapper, you know, that showed uh, that stretched from Eastern Europe to Kamchatka. You just look at it and say, this is really cool. And it is. And um, I don't have the rights to Objective Moscow, but I, uh, I know a lot of people would love to see the company that does own the rights uh, reprint it someday. And I would certainly be an avid customer for that. Um, you, Julian, earlier in the talk, you know, you, you would say you would raise the issue of how we predicted the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, and I have to say that is a very kind interpretation of what was going on with Objective Moscow. Uh, SPI had published earlier another alternate uh, future history game called Invasion America, in which the whole world invades North America, and um, the plucky Canadians, uh, perhaps foolishly, side with the fascist Yankee government, you know, um, at least in the in the primary scenario. Great game, a lot of fun, beautifully done. So, uh, so SPI said, well, why don't we, I don't know whose idea at SPI was, but someone said, well, why don't we do a game that shows the other side of it, where everybody invades the Soviet Union. And it is a different system, a different scale. Uh, Invasion America was a core level game. Objective Moscow was basically a division level game. But uh, they, 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 they clearly, they share a lot of, of themes in common. Um, but I think it is, it is very generous to suggest that because SPI was publishing these games, that we somehow were, you know, making predictions about the fall of the Soviet Union that everybody else missed. Now, to the question of why so many people in the West miss the Soviet Union, I am not uh, a Kremlinologist. I'm not a Soviet hand. Uh, I, I am sympathetic to the argument that 
we wanted to believe the Soviet Union would last forever because we were comfortable with having the Soviet Union as an adversary. And yeah, I, you don't have to believe that anyone at the Pentagon was faking intelligence to say that they had a vested interest in thinking that the Russians were 10 feet tall, because that's how you get your military budget increased, you know. Uh, and looking at what happened in Ukraine, I think uh, you can, in the last year, I think you can see that there is still a tendency to overestimate, uh, overestimate the adversary. Now, why do we miss these things? I mean, there are uh, a lot of reasons why intelligence is far from perfect. Uh, I think that um, the fact that uh, in the Soviet Union it was very difficult for foreigners, whether State Department diplomats or military attaches or journalists to get outside of Moscow and see the rest of the Soviet Union certainly contributed that. I mean, if you travel to Russia even today, you know, you get 100, 100 kilometers outside of Moscow or St. Petersburg, you're living in a different country. You know, uh, we saw early on during the renewed aggression against Ukraine, how many poor Russian soldiers, you know, were stealing washing machines and other appliances with an eye towards taking them back to their villages, which didn't even have in many cases, you know, uh, interior plumbing. So good luck hooking up your stolen European washing machine. But I, I think that we also uh, did not realize the extent to which the Soviet economy had diverted resources to the military at the expense of the civilian economy. Is this what you thought in the in 1989 when, um, well, 1989, the, the Warsaw Pact uh, disintegrated, but when when Gorbachev was displaced by a coup at that moment, um, having participated in that project, I mean, you at least had a visual knowledge of, of you know, the parts of, of the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, what was your reaction? I, uh, you know, I, I missed opportunity or, you know what, I had a sense it was going to happen. Or if, you know, was it, was it a game design uh, issue that was just, just, you know, if you just spent another hour, you would have sort of stumbled across it? Well, I think that... Um... I think Objective Moscow was not successful at modeling the forces that would weaken the Soviet Union from within. And to be fair, it wasn't attempting to. I mean, that wasn't the scenario. But And, uh, and Vengeance does look at that. I mean, Vengeance starts with, uh, in an alternate Soviet Union, an alternate universe where the Soviet Union still exists in 2025, and the Central Asian states rebel against uh against russia against central authority and you know they call for help from outside and the americans and the chinese and the iranians um you know uh anti up and you know and it's off to the races now uh one of the reasons that i was interested in readdressing these themes is that i i thought if if i had if i had the opportunity to do this again i would want to look at those sort of domestic political and ethnic pressures. I mean, all of that was empty, was absent from the game. Um, the original SPI NATO game, not to be confused with Mr. Camp's vastly superior uh, victory games and, um, and, and compass versions of NATO, had, had almost nothing political in it. I believe there was a scenario where you would roll a dice to see if the Warsaw Pact we would roll dice see if Warsaw Pact countries, you know, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and so on, would participate or not. Um, that was the level of sophistication that that you know SPI was attempting there. Um, the quad game that I did, Yugoslavia, which was designed basically to model conflict between uh, Soviet uh, and NATO forces and and Yugoslav forces at the um, battalion level. Um, included a scenario that I inserted, a, a civil war scenario in which the Yugoslav forces, uh, you know, divide in two, nominally Serb and nominally Croatian, uh, and go at it. Um, as far as I got into this was, again, 
die rolls, completely random die rolls to see which units, you know, would, would jump which way. I mean, this is not a political simulation uh, in any in any way. So, you know, looking back in those days, I have to say that we had not yet uh, learned how to model uh, politics or insurgency in these games, but that's not what people were, for the most part, attempting to do. There were some early political simulations at SPI. Uh, uh, Russian Civil War has uh, has held up pretty well, for example. Um, but that was a that game was succeeded in the marketplace, I'd say, because it balanced the kinetic activity with the political. Purely political simulations, uh, and one that came up was called Plot to Assassinate Hitler. Most of SPI's, uh, you know, war game base, myself included, looked at that and said, well, this is, this, this looks fascinating. What the hell am I supposed to do? So it's, it's really, I think, taken decades for, uh, for games like some of the ones you mentioned, uh, you mentioned as we were just starting our conversation, like Churchill, like Versailles, you know, to, to find an audience that includes uh, war gamers, partly because I think we're older now. And we um, we are interested in delving into those sorts of factors. Well, I, I, I mean, I've, I've got two two questions from what you just mentioned. You, of course, uh, served in Kosovo. You designed a game anticipating the uh, at least a civil war. Al Nofi, I think, wrote a book with Jim Dunnigan in I think it was like the early '80s, where one of his chapters was the breakup of Yugoslavia. So, in principle. I mean, I, I know I just I, I found it not surprising that it was war gamers who had the most detailed description. I mean, for Al Nofi, apparently it was obvious this was going to happen. Um, uh, so I mean, when you were there, what did, did again? Was this a, was this a uh, I, I, I missed this or, or uh, you know what? I got quite close to this. Well, I will say um, back in the mid 70s, when. Uh, when Yugoslavia first came out, I got to tell you a little story now. So a, uh, a diplomat from the Yugoslav uh, United Nations mission came to SPI to pick up a copy of the game. And, you know, he and uh, he met with Jim Dunnigan, you know, the head of SPI, who, you know, was walk, gave him the nickel tour of the place. And, you know, a lot of first time visitors to SPI didn't know what to expect. I think a lot of gamers were, were disappointed. They thought there'd be guys walking around in white lab coats or something. And it was a pretty scruffy bunch. And if you were 30 years old, you were an old man at, at SPI. And, um, and I was working that summer, uh, summer of 76, actually as the receptionist at SPI, which is how I had sidled into this. Anyway, um, so the, the um, Dunnigan introduced this Yugoslav diplomat to me, and he kind of he just looked at me like, "Who is this punk kid, you know, who is designing so-called analysis about Yugoslavia?" And um, and I recall, you know, stammering something about how most of our games were science fiction titles, or I mostly did science fiction titles, and he just sneered and kind of held up the Yugoslavia game and said, "Yeah, like this one." You know, uh, as if anyone could possibly imagine a civil war in Yugoslavia. So the Yugoslav civil war was an enormous tragedy. But I think it does. I am telling the story to highlight a point that you just made, uh, Julian, which is that people who were involved in war games, not just the designers, but I mean, the, the you know, the, the hobbyist base, we we were playing paper time machines to use a term that SPI's advertising team came up with, you know, and that time machine worked in both directions and we were willing to explore what ifs and there are designers and, you know, Joe Miranda is one of them, you know, who have made careers largely, I mean, or in, in large part, and I, I say this, uh, this is a compliment, Joe, by really pushing the envelope at, and, you know, and, not just simulating, you know, um, the Battle of Kursk for the 89th time, but, you know, but trying to open people's eyes to different historical and future hist history possibilities. Yeah, so with, with regard to Central Asia, I, I'd sort of like to highlight a, a good bookend for that. I had uh, some students who were 
Turkic expert, experts. Uh, one went to the University of Toronto to do graduate work. We played um, Professor Miranda's game, which is, you know, but if you want to find how something falls apart, you have to see how they put it together in the first place. And it was a, 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 a very high death rate game where Russian and British adventurers would wander uh, through Central Asia uh, trying to expand influence. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention it at the time to Professor Miranda, but um, the survival rate of those adventurers basically uh, sadly depended on their height. The taller they were, the less likely they would be shot by by bandits as they uh, sort of wandered through the map. But you were in Central Asia. Um, uh, the 1980s, um, uh, we already saw the Aral Sea shrinking. Um, uh, it, it's, you know, of course, uh, uh, you know, religion is complicated, but uh, you had Takfiri militancy already being sponsored by, you know, various uh, state actors. Uh, mm -hmm. The prediction was the place would completely fall apart. Um, you know, how little, how little did we know? Now, you were there. Can you, can you address the puzzle, you know, both, both, both as, a, as, a, as a scholar and as a war gamer? What explains its stability in, in, at, when it's at the, at the same time that, at the, as it's losing per capita water? Okay. Well, to break, to break that question into a couple different pieces, um, the environmental tragedy in uh, Uzbekistan, in, uh, particularly in the RLC region, is a huge problem, a deep tragedy, and very much, I, I would put the blame for that squarely on Moscow, which was perfectly happy to endanger the environment of the you know, far off reaches of the Russian empire. Uh, you know, they, they, were not, they were not poisoning water sources uh, in you know, metropolitan Moscow or experimenting with um, with uh, with nerve gas, you know, outside St. Petersburg. There's a reason that stuff was so far away. Uh, but the the more interesting question, uh, I think, is why the Central Asian states have remained relatively stable since independence. And I, you know, uh, I. I think it's important to remember that the Central Asian states uh, are not carbon copies of one another, you know, uh, in economic and social, in historical terms, in their relations to Russia and China, they're very different. I mean, Kazakhstan, most Kazakhs don't even consider Kazakhstan to be Central Asian. You walk into a map store in, in Kazakhstan and ask for a map of Central Asia, you'll get a map without Kazakhstan in it. You know, They consider themselves sui generis somewhere between Russia and those people down South. Um, the Uzbeks, and I, these are grotesque generalizations, but generalizing can be fun. You know, um, the Uzbeks will point out that they're the ones who built these magnificent Silk Road cities like Samarkand and Bukhara. You know, and whereas some of their some of the neighboring countries were founded by the descendants of you know of horse nomads, and so the the Uzbeks tend to think of themselves as the the ones with the most sophisticated political and economic culture. Um, why did it remain stable? Well, I, I know the most about Uzbekistan, and I will tell you that a big reason why the, the people of Uzbekistan have accepted, uh, for the most part, a, a rather autocratic political system, although it's starting to open up a little bit now, um, is that they look across the uh, the river uh, towards Afghanistan and they see what a raging mess Afghanistan is. And uh, a succession of Uzbek governments, I mean, first President uh, Karimov, who had been a you know, Soviet apparatchik until his death in 2016, and now uh, President Mir Mirziyayev, have been able to argue that uh, they have brought uh, they have brought the Uzbek people stabilnost, stability, you know, and they're better off this way. And when I first, uh, I first moved to Uzbekistan in 2011, I will be honest, I thought it was going to be North Korea. You know, you heard a lot of stories about this terrible autocratic government. And I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. I mean, it was an autocratic government, but um, uh, uh 
most people, you would see people getting on with their lives, you know, taking the kids to school, going to work. And if you kept your head down and stayed out of politics, you could lead a pretty normal life. Now, I don't say that I sound like an apologist. I don't mean to. I mean, if you were the citizen of a country, you should not have to keep your head down and stay out of politics. You should have the right, you know, to try to better build a better life for yourself and your family and to insist that the people administering the country are not corrupt, you know, and, uh, and our respect rule of law and Uzbekistan and the other Central Asian countries have a long way to go. But I, I do think that um, the fact that they are uh, that they are not facing the sort of, of problems that the Afghans have faced every day is part of the answer. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, for me, it's absolutely fascinating because, um, you know, all the predictions were in the opposite direction. And as you might have seen in the last year, there was fighting in the Farhana Valley. And of course, the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz are having an issue. And the Uzbeks, I believe, bombed uh, one of their neighbors. And, you know, we, of course, we saw the, the civil unrest in, in Kazakhstan. I'm wondering wonder if there isn't a bigger game there, especially, uh, you know, in, in addition to a collapse of the Soviet Union. But just, I mean, frankly, a game on your experience because... Uh, it, it, it's it's an unsustainable bubble of overlapping Chinese and Russian influence. Um, so I, I'd, I'd love to, I'd buy that game. Well, and, you know, I, I, I want to make clear, I mean, you know, most of the Central Asian governments are, are, are pretty, I mean, they're repressive autocratic states. I don't mean to suggest that the citizenry is happy with their lives, okay? But there are reasons that they have not rebelled. Um I think uh, the point you just touched on about Central Asia as kind of a, uh, the new great game with Russia and China and the United States competing for, for influence is an important one. And I have seen recently in some circles a, um, you know, a little bit of high fiving uh, this notion that, well, the Central Asians are all angry at Russia. You know, they see that Putin is attempting to recreate the former Soviet Union. They want no part of it. You know, they refused to send troops to Ukraine. They are um, they are flexing their muscles, flexing their independence in some way. So, you know, we can just swoop in and flip that space on the game map from red to blue. Frankly, there was a lot of similar talk when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 in places like Washington and Ankara that, you know, we are going to move in, not militarily, you know, we're going to move in economically and diplomatically and be greeted with open arms. Okay. Uh, it's going to remain contested space. And the Chinese are making a huge push into Central Asia with their Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I would also like to point out, you know, there's a phrase that uh, more gamers use about how the enemy gets a vote. The people and governments of these countries get a vote. You know, they fundamentally will get to decide where and when and how they want to cooperate with foreign forces. So I, I think that it is important that the United States, the European Union, other Western countries, including Canada, uh, have an, a strong diplomatic presence and push for rule of law and economic development that will uh, that will benefit the ordinary citizen. But we should be realistic about what is achievable in places like that. Yeah, in, in South Asia, in particular, India and Pakistan, they, they were constantly uh, discussing uh, uh, extending their influence into Central Asia, and, and it ultimately didn't occur. They hadn't anticipated the cultural differences, the difficulty of, of asserting their influence uh, past um, sort of that, that, that Afghan that um, that Afghan uh, belt. Um, this uh, is can I just add? This is a mindset that that I think uh, American policymakers are sometimes prone to to exaggerate our ability to reshape foreign countries and their cultures. I mean, I also served in Iraq uh, very early on in uh, in that adventure, and. Uh, there was a lot of loose talk in Washington and in the Republican Palace uh, where, you know, the Coalition Provisional Authority was attempting to rebuild Iraq in America's image, that we were going to supplant Iranian economic and political influence. You know, 
uh, in a region where these countries had lived together, you know, literally forever, and where there were very deep economic and cultural and religious connections. I mean, I, uh, I sometimes find myself talking to American military officers uh, who, who, who tend towards giddiness sometimes, uh, and, and at least until they've gone through command and general staff college and war college and, and learned about how the world works, and said, can you imagine some foreign military coming in to Canada or Mexico and saying we are going to expunge all American influence over Canada or Mexico. Now, I know Canadians and Mexicans who might welcome that, but it doesn't seem very realistic. No, no, no definitely not. Uh, so it, it, I, I really, of course, want to explore your experience in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, but just, just on the one last um, a question on, on Central Asia. I believe in the 90s, uh, and this, this is, you know, curious for wargaming. There were two American actors, the Clinton administration, which wanted to increase American influence and the American oil companies that actually didn't want Washington to increase their influence and were actually happy to do business with the governments that were there. I was wondering if you, uh, did you experience that or hear about that? Um, uh, was that a correct interpretation? Now, that was something I had read in the 90s. That, so the, the, the American, defining what is the, the, the American national interest was problematic right from the get-go. In Afghanistan. Uh, sorry, no, in Central Asia. Uh, in American Central oil Asia. companies going, you know what, we'll do business, we like it this way, and Clinton yeah. going, no, we have to stamp, you know, Washington's interest. The oil companies going, no, 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 we, American national interest is, is fighting our interests. Well, I think that, um, I'm generalizing here, but I think the American energy companies um, have a high tolerance for risk and they have shown that they are willing to do business with a lot of unsavory characters around the world. Uh, so I don't believe they were saying, hey, we need Washington to come in and wave a magic wand, you know, and establish Jeffersonian democracy in these countries before we will invest. I mean, they're more concerned about the security situation and, you know, uh, efforts to attract American companies to invest in Afghanistan, and I'm contrasting this, you know, didn't get very far because even though successive American administrations really pushed for this and really encouraged it, you know, business people are business people, and they just saw that the risks were too high. I think that there were a lot of uh, American companies in different fields, extractive industries, for example, that might have been willing to be the second company into Afghanistan, but they wanted somebody else to go first, you know, in a big way uh, and observe their experience. So if I could ask you to uh, put on your insurgency, counterinsurgency uh, designer hat, what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq? Uh, particularly, I mean, obviously the, the, the bigger catastrophic failure was, was in Afghanistan. I'm not sure if, if Iraq was a failure. Uh, I mean, in many ways, it's, it's a tremendous success. No one's building a giant cannon uh, aimed at an American ally. Um, but... Uh, in terms of hearts and minds, I mean, uh, when, when you were there, how did you conceptualize, measure, uh, and, and think dynamically about how to get people to think about how they think? Oh, man. Uh, where to begin? So, yeah, uh, I think that the U.S.-led uh, invasion of Iraq uh, will go down as a one of the most catastrophic decisions in American history. Um, like a lot of people, I as as you know as a as a mid career diplomat uh i believed what we were told about the the need to invade iraq to forestall uh saddam from causing further uh you know launching further uh, wars of aggression in the region um you know we're all old enough to remember that painful period having said that you know went in uh, first as a provincial administrator and then later in other capacities, um, trying to find ways to uh, help create a functioning democracy in a country where the, um, the Shiite population in particular had really been marginalized and forced from power. And there are a lot of reasons, it's very, a lot of reasons why that didn't come together. Uh, you know, one rather facile phrase is that is that the um, the this 
it's a gross generalization, but the Sunni realized they were beaten before the Shiites realized they had won. So, uh, you know, after we came in and kicked over the apple cart, got rid of Saddam, there were, there were significant Sunni actors who were willing to accept a diminished role as kind of the junior partner in a new Iraq. And the Shiites who had, you know, not been in power were uh, were very insecure about that and not ready to um, not ready effectively to deal. And you know, we spent years trying to broker this. Many of um, many of the Americans and British and others who were involved in this knew Iraq, spoke very good Arabic, uh, had a lot to contribute, knew how to listen. Many of us did not, and you know, we're kind of stumbling around in the dark. Um, yeah, so Iraq today, um, it's reasonably stable. Uh, there is, uh, it, it is hard to call it, you know, a, a Western style democracy, but there is at least, there is an effort to make sure that all of the different uh, communities there, you know, have some role in the country's future. If that sounds like a very weak endorsement, it is. I mean, if I had a time machine and can go back and uh, and avoid the, this war, I would have done so. You know, even given that Saddam was a miserable son of a bitch who was oppressing his people, uh, I wish we could have found uh, a way to support efforts to um, to to liberalize Iraq. You know, without without going the route that we did. Uh, the fact that we have left we left a few thousand American troops in there to keep the lid on, I think, is one of the reasons that um, that there's relative political stability there. In contrast, in Afghanistan, you know, people are going to be writing books about this for forever. Um, the the outcome in Afghanistan last year was the result of 20 years of actions and decisions by Afghans and Americans and others, by successive US administrations, by Republicans and Democrats. There's plenty of blame to go around. People like me who served there uh, have a share of that blame and will carry it to the grave. Uh, I, I actually think that the, the argument that if we had left a couple of thousand troops in Afghanistan to keep the lid on, that the Afghan military would not have um, would not have collapsed is a fair one. And this is the sort of thing, you know, you could use war games and political simulations to simulate. Um, it's also a reminder to people who study history and political science that individuals matter. You know, um, if, if Ghani had stayed and fought, that might have made some difference. Uh, you know, if the president of Ukraine had, you know, thrown money into a suitcase and fled, uh, who knows, you know, if the Ukrainian people would have shown the same level of resolve. I, I tend to think they would have. I think Ukrainian bravery and resilience is deeper, you know, than one man. But it made a huge difference when the president of Ukraine said, I need ammunition, not a ride, not only in how that uh, strengthened the resolve of his own people, but in how it encouraged outside forces to say, well, maybe the Ukrainians, you know, are, are worth backing here. May, may I ask, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not a flag waver, but um, uh, Iraq seems to be sustainable. It has a sustainable democracy, which meant the underlying uh, philosophy that uh, you have to give people a chance and then, you know, give them some minimal support seemed to work. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, obviously, I'm not a specialist. I've never been to Iraq, but as you know, as a taxpayer, um, the amount of money that would have to be spent to restrain and deter Saddam Hussein would be ridiculous. And it's constant threat to Saudi Arabia. And you might recall some of the, you know, the the close calls we had. He took all those hostages out of Kuwait, and you know, we we basically promised that if he released them, we wouldn't do anything to him. And then we he released them, and then we invaded him. So. Uh, you know, decays are, are fairly stupid, but they're going to go through that same sequence. And Canada recently had an experience with two of our nationals being effectively kidnapped in China. So dictators know they can do this. Um, I, mean, I, I know I thought Saddam Hussein was a, was a fantastic threat. But, you know, in, in counterinsurgency games, uh, not games, rather, in counterinsurgency reality, we try to get uh, people to buy into an idea. 
of, of political legitimacy. And it seemed to work in, in Iraq. Now, maybe Afghanistan was just a, a generational timing issue. Well, well, I mean, well by that standpoint, uh, could we measure it? And isn't it, isn't it a success in Iraq? They, in, in Iraq, they expect uh, dem democracy for their political system now. Well, I, I'm not sure that that Iraq, the Iraqi political system, uh, is is a five star democracy. Other than in the sense that you know different affinity groups have a seat at the table, which is how democracy is defined in much of the world. You know, more than one individual, one vote. Um, I think that it has been a struggle for Iraqi governments to form that the average citizen can look at and say, you know, this government works for us. It's there to serve and protect me as a citizen. Uh, it was tougher in Afghanistan. Afghanistan had a succession of deeply corrupt governments. Um, the United States knew these were deeply corrupt governments, but we managed to be convinced that, um, that we needed to work with these people. And gradually we were making progress, you know, and there was all there were always enough good days where, where it said where you could say, oh, look, you know, there's a new deputy minister of finance or something is really cleaning things up. You know, let's let's support this. Um, there a popular phrase in uh, in among American uh, military and civilian allies in both places was. You know, you cannot shoot your way out of an insurgency, right? That you have to change the conditions of the game. You can't just kill enough people. Um, yeah, uh, we talk about coin math where, you know, sometimes you, you, you kill somebody and, you know, all of his cousins suddenly join up and, and suddenly you have more enemies than you started with. That doesn't mean, you know, to be harsh that it's never appropriate you know, to use force in, in fighting an insurgency, but, uh, but you can make things a lot worse. And you know, most of the people who were shooting at us in Afghanistan, I would submit, were not doing so for ideological reasons. They were doing it because, you know, they saw a foreign army uh, and were told these people are here to suppress you, to suppress your religion. And so you need to fight them just like, you know, your father and your uncles fought against the Russians. Um, I would sometimes find myself, you know, speaking with fairly naive young um, American military or, you know, you folks from the civilian agencies they, they tended to be older and more and more cynical and a little flintier. But yeah, talking to young military officers who would say, well, we're here to help these people. You know, why don't they get it? And, you know, trying to, to put it in folksy language people would understand, I'd say, okay, well, imagine if, you know, the Chinese army came to the United States to get rid of a dictator, you know, at the request of the bulk of the American people. And they got rid of this dictator and they were still sticking around a year or two later, um, you know, what do you think would happen? And they'd kind of say, well, you know, we'd probably start shooting at their asses. So I think that um, we could go on and on about other historical examples. I mean, look at Vietnam. The, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have much, much positive to say about Vietnamese communism of the 1970s, but there was a succession of corrupt Vietnamese governments that never convinced the ordinary citizen that they were worth fighting for. May, may I propose, uh, I guess, a, a competing conjecture, which is the the success of of the shoot our way out of it counterinsurgency model in South Korea, where the Americans took total control of the government, total control of the military, and they allowed the, the KCIA to to shoot very large numbers of suspected communists. Uh, I, I, I spent about 10 years in Pakistan, over 10 years on and off, you know, for months at a time. And, uh, you know, I contrast the Pakistanis in the Swat Valley using, you know, artillery, just, you know, cleaning out villages. Yes, it, it produced a million and a half refugees in Karachi alone. I mean, you have, you probably have 5 million uh, refugees uh, from the region, but it meant that uh, now, of course, there, there, I mean, there's the issue that, you know, by the time the U.S. was in Vietnam, you, you couldn't have this uh, sort of MacArthurian uh, U.S. occupation of Germany kind of strong arm uh, 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 sort of social engineering. 
Uh, you know, this is this is the age of decolonization. The U.S. couldn't show up and just, you know, tell the Vietnamese precisely what to do. But um, was there any learning, you know, not learning, but a, a, an attempt to, I guess, cheat the system by by mimicking what the Pakistanis were doing in terms of coercion? Uh, was it Fort Leavenworth where I spoke with some of the um, mid-range officers, majors, who were conducting the operations in the Swat Valley and Khyber Pakhtunwa? And it seemed it seemed like they had a model that worked. And today. Uh, I mean, you know, in the last few months, it's spiked up again, but um, they have a model that works reasonably for a culture where everyone owns an AKM already because, you know, they're, they're semi pastoral sheep herders. Well, there, certainly there were there were efforts to, you know, to engage in what uh, what they sometimes call in uh, in Latin America, giving people the choice of silver or lead. You know, uh, you bring in economic development opportunities and you let people know that if they, um, you know, if they oppose this new reality, you know, then uh, it's going to cost them the um, you know, the, in Afghanistan. We also there was also the challenge that there was not a strong tradition of uh, of central governments, you know, who had uh, a lot of influence, you know, outside the cities. I mean, I don't want to overplay that. There are people who will tell you there was no Afghan sense of national identity. I think that's grossly exaggerated. Um, there will be, there are people who will tell you that about Iraq too, and they will say, well, people were more loyal you know, to their Sunni or Shiite or Kurdish identity than they were to an ideal of Iraq. And that may have sometimes been true. But if you ask people, well, you know, do you think you'd be better off with three independent countries? I mean, even most Kurds would say no. I mean, the Kurds liked the level of autonomy they had, but they didn't necessarily want to see the country, you know, break up. Um, the the main element that was that was missing from... Uh, from the mix in Afghanistan was time. Now, I'm not saying that with more time, you know, all of these problems would have been solved, but I will say this. Uh, uh, any number of times I saw uh, journalists or, say, uh, congressional leaders come to Kabul uh, on fact-finding tours, and they'd say, okay, well, how many years are you going to need, you know, to fix this place, you know, fix this place being shorthand, but, you know, for making it, making it what is acceptable to us, you know, bringing peace, um, something resembling Western style justice and some element, some level of prosperity to the place. So it's not a failed state. And I'd see ambassadors and generals, you know, answer, honestly, it's going to take us 20, 30 years. And a congressman would say, well, you're not going to get 20 or 30 years. You know, you're going to get much less than that because, um, you know, the American people just aren't don't have that patience for this sort of investment. And by investment, I don't just mean money. I mean the lives of, you know, young Americans. Uh, and, you know, year in and year out, there was this attitude that, well, I'm just going to do my share of the task. I will I will do my bit for the year or two that I'm here. And I'm talking about civilians as well as military, you know, and um, it's not going to let it explode on my watch. And I think that was the attitude in the White House for a long time as well. And, um, you know, if we had been more honest with one another, we would have approached the, the whole thing differently. If you go back to um, to 2001, when we deployed military forces in, uh, in Afghanistan after 9-11, you know, we originally had no notion that we were going to uh, try to administer the whole country and and uh, and redesign it, you know, rebuild its culture. We had much more limited goals. And unlike Iraq, you know, we never uh, established an occupation government. There was always a, um, you know, a, an, a, an autonomous, uh, an independent sovereign Afghan government. Obviously, you know, the Westerners had a hell of a lot of influence over it. May I ask uh, before we before we take a break? May I ask? There's so much here, and we haven't even touched about the all the other regions that that uh, you had served in. Uh, if if I may ask a, uh, a, a an insurgency design, um, well, not so much a question, but a comment that I'd like to get your reaction to. My, you know, I, again, I was in Pakistan, and um, for us, what was politically consequential were the different strands of uh, political Islam, right? The different paths that Islam would affect the political system. Um, 
and in Pakistan, you have your, you know, your, your Hanbali Arab interpretation from Arabia, heavily funded. Uh, and it, it has political parties that support it, like the Al-Hadith. But in Pakistan, you have this uh, um, uh, almost like a, a Greek mystery religion, sort of mystical Turkic influence from Central Asia, which created uh, cults like the Chistis and the Nakhbandiya. And uh, in Pakistan, it was thought, at least among the scholars I was with, that this, this created a very different kind of political flavor you know, both in Central Asia and in Pakistan. Um, and, you know, in, in Afghanistan, because of the Pakhtun Wali and, and the fact that they're semi-pastoral, it was a different environment. Um, so I, I bring I, I bring two game designs that I thought were really good. Uh, Colonel um, Richard Davis in 1991 in Strategy and Tactics magazine did Toyota Wars, where it's basically the war in Chad. And he has, uh, it, he only designed one game. And the game, I have to tell you, again, I had two students over three months for a tutorial playing this thing. And it was, it was horrible. It was so detailed. Uh, the country is broken down into 15 different tribes. And there's a, a matrix where if you ally with one tribe, it triggers the grievance of the next one and you lose them. And so every tribe could be flipped over into, you know, whether it's the Libyan or the French backed uh, faction. The mm -hmm. second issue, and this is the one which I think is the more important that is, I, I, I think it matters. And, you know, maybe, maybe, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, again, I, I've, I, what you've seen is, is um, decades um, more than most people have seen. But I always thought there should be a, a, a fight over ideas. You know, as a political scientist, you're going to create legitimacy if people buy into ideas. But in, in war game, we haven't found a way of comparing ideas. There was one game, um, uh, the GMT game, um, uh, Here I Stand, which is, I, I guess, a remake of an SPI game. And there you you uh, you spend points translating the Bible. And so you've got the French Bible, the English Bible, and the German Bible, you're translating them and you're you're trying to, I think Cranberry, was it Cranberry? I my history is awful. I I I've, I just butchered the name of the English translator, but there was a, a sub not a subterranean, but a, a um I guess in those times the British translator was hiding in attics in Belgium, translating this Bible that he was sort of smuggling into England, and you can assassinate the translators and slow things down. Um mm. I'm wondering if you know if, if counterinsurgency games should have more of this people who hate people factions and um, some way of actually measuring ideas to compare them. Right? It's not pro or anti-American. I mean, that's it, it. Really is. You know what? I want postal service, but I, I still want to you know m you know marry my cousin. I don't want you to come in and change a land possession because you know I, me as a landowner in Afghanistan, I don't want to I don't want to have to deal with the eighty percent that are landless. So how are you going to preserve my natural? Uh, and in, in you know in Pakistan in the Swat Valley, uh, people you know depicted it in the media as sort of a takfiri militancy against the government. But it was it was really no one no one questioned Anglo-Saxon law. Everybody loved Anglo-Saxon law. It was it was really political. It was it was Sharia law trying to clean up the mess of feudal uh, a feudal mislaw where you know people were wealthy landowners were distorting the law to to keep uh, property. So sorry, uh, forgive me for my. Um, my, Pakist my, my Pakistani outburst. But um, uh, I, you know, what do you think of the idea of focus, measuring, measuring and comparing and creating a dynamic for a, a market of ideas and uh, I guess factionalizing things uh, domestically? Um, well, let, let me grab onto one piece of what you just said, Julian. And that is the role of religion in international affairs. I think that Western diplomats are very often really wary of that. There is um, there is a book called Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft, which talks about its number of case studies uh, of diplomats and political leaders using using religious faith to find common ground. Uh, I will tell you, many people at the State Department, where I spent my you know professional life, are personally um, well, and personally not terribly religious. I mean, some are, but you know, um, Americans are so inculcated with the concept of separation of church and state, at least until recently, uh, that that uh, a lot of diplomats were really wary about talking to anyone, you know, anyone wearing clerical garb. Uh, something I saw happen in Iraq that um, was that the military was didn't share this phobia, partly because, you know, the U.S. military, like like most Western militaries, has a chaplain corps. You know, they are not allergic 
uh, to um, to religion, you know, and traditionally chaplains, whether they were you know Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, you know, their their job they they did not see their job as trying to convert soldiers to their faith. They saw them as seeing to the spiritual and mental health needs, you know, of everyone around them. Well, one thing that um, that General Petraeus did when he was the four-star commander of multinational force Iraq was he told his chaplains, well, you know, you're going to go outside the wire and you are going to get to know the imams. You know, you're going to sit down and you are going to drink tea with them, just like all the platoon leaders and company commanders are, just like all the diplomats are, and exchange views and see if you can get, you know, any any kind of understanding about what their uh, congregations are looking for, you know, and how we can... Um, you know, how we can move towards, you know, towards some sort of modus vivendi, some sort of peace here. And some of the chaplains said, well, gee, that's not in my job description. Do I have to? But of course they had to because they were in the army, you know, and they went out there and they found that they could indeed find common ground with uh, with Muslim clerical leaders. You know, my experience has been, in fact, that uh, it's much easier to, for, for most, Muslims to connect with other believers, especially other people of the book, you know, Jews and Christians, when you when you get away from the secular political and security issues in a place like Israel, say, than it is to uh, to connect with non-believers. So I think that this is uh, this is something that we have to do a lot more work on. Yeah. So with, with that, I, I, I mean, we have uh, again. I, we still have a. I have a huge number of questions, of course, on on uh, Ukraine and Turkey and Kosovo. But um, I think this would be an appropriate time to take a fifteen minute break, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. So, Ambassador Kosnet, I have a question about what is going on in Ukraine. Were you surprised uh, by what happened, when it happened, how it happened? Um, how how would you uh, operationalize and measure uh, the variables that matter the most? Um, I mean, what are the things that we should be focusing on there? What are some of the surprises, and where is this going to go? Well, I'd like to say that um, that I brilliantly and presciently predicted the uh, the strong and resilient Ukrainian reaction to the renewed aggression. I can't say that I did. Uh, there were people, however, who, who knew in the West, who knew the Ukrainian military, knew the Ukrainian people who were not at all surprised. Uh, two that come to mind are two former commanders of U.S. Army Europe, Mark Hurtling and Ben Hodges, who are very active uh, in social media and, you know, on the, on the think tank and, and TV uh, circuit, who can explain, you know, why they had seen the, the improvements in the Ukrainian army over the years and, you know, we're not surprised. And also, you know, and I think in, in the case of, of, of these gentlemen, it's not Monday morning quarterbacking. They also expected the Russians uh, to be bad, maybe not as bad as they were. But I, I think a lot of analysts knew the Russians would struggle with logistics. Uh, their logistics system was still stuck in uh, Soviet World War II mode in a lot of ways, um, you know, using uh using human muscle power for a lot of tasks that western armies now use um you know palletized uh you know uh we use palletized truck transport for just as one example and people who knew russian logistics knew that they would be tied to the railroads in ways that would make them very, very make it very difficult for them to move forward uh did people expect the degree to of command and control problems uh, the degree of hubris. I mean, I didn't. I didn't have any, you know, any any really way, any real way to judge this. I do remember very early on, you know, seeing video on uh, you know, on CNN or something, of, you know, of of armor heavy Russian units. I mean, uh, you know, battalion level armored uni units just moseying down a road without any infantry, without anybody out for flank security. And the Ukrainians were picking them off, you know, with ATGMs. And I, I was thinking, you know, 
any of us who have played tactical war games would know better than that. You know, you put up some drones, you push out some infantry, um, you know, you have suppressive fire. What's with these guys? It was incredible hubris. And I think hubris is, uh, and, th and now I am moving into Monday morning quarterbacking. I'm not saying I would have predicted any of this, but looking at what happened, you know, uh, it seems that Putin ha had been misled into thinking that uh, Zelensky was very unpopular, that the ru predominantly Russian speaking population of Eastern Ukraine, you know, would greet the, the Russian troops you know, with with flowers and you know and and open arms, uh, there are reports out there. This is all open source. You know, I don't. I, I have no idea if it's true or not. That the FSB units that were responsible for softening up uh, Ukraine and and creating uh, disarray and you know and a and a government you know, uh, a, a quizzling government ready to step in, they had either completely wasted or stolen the money, you know, and it really, they really didn't make an effort. The alternative explanation is that they gave the money to the Ukrainians who double crossed them, you know. <laughs> um, two points that I, I do think are, are, are the conventional wisdom now. One is that um, the Ukrainian military has learned enormous lessons since 2014. You know, the Russians rolled in, to Crimea in 2014 and just kicked their ass. And they have had eight years of fighting. Uh, there has been an opportunity for talented leaders to rise to the top. You know, uh, this, by the way, this is uh, an experience that I observed when I was in a corps headquarters in Iraq. I mean, there'd be some, there'd be some heavy fighting among the Iraqis and it was an opportunity, you know, I mean, it, it, nobody wanted to take heavy casualties, but they'd see who the, who the real leaders were, whether they were in the nascent NCO Corps or in the officer Corps and they'd get promoted and they'd move up. And, you know, this was, this was a, a process. Uh, I think the same thing happened in Ukraine over a period of eight years. Uh, you know, it is well known, it is not secret that the U.S. and other NATO militaries were training Ukrainian special forces and others. Uh, it's not that the Ukrainians owe their success to their foreign handlers. It's that they took up advantage of all the opportunities to improve their doctrine, to improve their training and leadership you know, over the years. Uh, and I don't have to belabor this. I mean, the Russians expected this to be easy. We have all heard stories of, you know, units that advanced with their dress uniforms, you know, in the back of the truck for the victory parade. Uh, they were not ready for, uh, to provide the logistical support needed for a long fight. And, Moving to the political and diplomatic dimension, yeah, uh, Putin was, I think, clearly taken by surprise by the degree of NATO solidarity, NATO unity, and by the willingness of Democrats and Republicans in the United States to to stop arguing for two minutes in order to um, to pass needed legislation and take executive action, you know, to get new weapons and new equipment flowing to um, to Ukraine. And you know, whether or not the Europeans could have done that if the Americans had decided to sit back, you know, is an open question. It's that's that's alt history stuff. That's wargaming stuff. But um, I uh, I do think the fact that the U.S. government and the U.S. people, the American people rose to the occasion uh, is not something that the Russians had adequately planned for. As a, as a political scientist, how would you uh, explain? And you've, of course, you've you've had um, more than a lifetime's experience with non-democratic regimes. Um, what what do authoritarian regimes do to themselves to to create this kind of bad information flow? Uh, live in a bubble, you know. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, Putin apparently has surrounded himself with yes men and sycophants who tell him what he wants to believe. Um, you you could see he you know right before the war started there was this um, this theatrical event where Putin you know gave a speech to his cabinet his senior leaders 
kind of explaining the, the aims of the war. And one or two people actually tried to speak. You know, they forgot that, that they were just pawns in this uh, operation, that they were just background extras and tried to challenge him and got shut down immediately. He wasn't having it. You know, he had already decided what he was going to do. Um, I think that's a big part of it. Part of it also is that um, the Russians had the, had convinced themselves that um, that when, when Putin would talk about how there really is no Ukraine, you know, it's really part of Russia, uh, there is no sense of national identity. I mean, that was crazy nuts to begin with, but after you know, it it every time uh, the Russians bombed a civilian target. Uh, it put the lie to the notion that they were going in just to liberate, you know, their their brothers and sisters. And it's hard to keep track of all the different explanations the Russians have come up with for why they are doing this. I mean, my view in, in shorthand is that uh, I completely reject the idea that Russia felt threatened by uh, by NATO's growth. Uh, I mean, this is controversial and there, you know, people I respect who have different views on this. I think they saw that as Ukraine was moving towards the West politically, economically, um, culturally, that this was a threat to them. It is reminiscent of what happened in 1991, where, and this is, this is an old story, uh, but one of the, one of the key reasons that communism fell is that the communists made the mistake of letting East Germans watch West German television. And it didn't matter what the propaganda machine was saying, if East Germans could turn on the TV and see who was driving Trabis and who was driving Mercedes. They knew which system offered better, uh, you know, hope of a better future for their children. So, it, it, as, you know, again, as an experienced um, uh, diplomat, how when you look at Vladimir Putin, how much of it is 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 uh gosh is he as stupid as some people characterize him or is he absolutely ruthless and just doesn't care about the russian people the russian state uh the prospects of russia i mean is is, is i mean you, you might recall having been in iraq saddam hussein's uh political theatrics where he had people dragged out of the out of the uh, legislature as a way of sort of dominating the state through his personality uh on you know on a scale of one to ten um how would you um, uh, evaluate Vladimir Putin as an intelligent man? Well, I've never met Putin and I haven't served in Russia. I need to be clear on that. Okay. My experience of the Soviet, former Soviet space is from Central Asia. Uh, and I speak Russian, but very, very badly. So I, I am not, you know, I'm not the, the best person to ask about this. I don't think Putin is stupid. I think he, he just got fixated uh, on you know rebuilding, uh, rebuilding Russian power for shorthand, you could say rebuilding the Soviet Union. Uh, you know the Finns. The Finns certainly think his goal was really to rebuild the Russian Empire, so he wasn't going to stop with rebuilding the Soviet Union. And you know there's a theory that he's very sick and that he saw this as his legacy project to restore Russia to greatness. And you know he wasn't very interested in listening to, you know, to the naysayers. And, you know, he, he believed what he wanted to believe. And um, the people who wanted to make him happy told him what he wanted to hear. Well, I, I very often, uh, you know, try to try to explain to my students that these uh, individuals have been selected through a very difficult process. And so, you know, even if their IQs are not very high, their emotional quotients are very high. So, you know, even even you know today caricatured characters like Mussolini and Hitler and Saddam Hussein and Mao Zedong, you know what? They're actually uh, you know these people we we can't personality profile them because they're much better at operating a room than we are. Um, am I wrong? As is that a, a sort of a, a wrong-headed political science interpretation? Or again, is is Putin frankly less mature than we are? I th here's how I'll answer that, Julian. I, I have worked for a lot of very smart leaders, um, both you know, in and out of uniform, okay? And, and there are two kinds of smart leaders. There's, there's a smart leader who says, I'm the smartest person in the room. Uh, I'm not going to listen to anybody else. It's a waste of time. I know what I'm doing. You know, um, people can like just 
get get you know fall in behind me or get out of the way and then there are smart leaders who say i'm smart enough to know that i should not be threatened by other smart people so i need to solicit the ideas of other smart people preferably other smart people who did not grow up in the same organizational institutional culture i did and might have a different point of view i mean that was even true uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, when I was a State Department foreign policy advisor, you know, in a military headquarters, and there were a couple of other civilians in there. And, you know, we weren't hired, and these, these billets were not created um, because someone said, well, let's get this Cosnet guy, he's smarter, you know, than, than all of these generals and colonels. It's he's got a different perspective. He comes from a different organization. And also, maybe as an outsider, I was a little bit more willing to challenge conventional wisdom than others because, you know, I, I didn't have to worry that I was going to get in trouble. Um, and I have to say that the three star I worked for, General Odierno, welcomed that. And, you know, I would sometimes say things that took him aback, but then he'd remember, well, this is why I hired this guy, you know, and I, he didn't necessarily... Um, he wasn't always persuaded by what I was telling him, but he welcomed it. And that is what it mi is missing from people like Saddam Hussein and Vladimir Putin. And I could name some American political figures as well, you know, who are just convinced that they um, that they're the smartest guy around and they don't have to listen to anyone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I, I raise that because we have, you know, Napoleon III, who, you know, should never have been in power. And, in, you know, if there had been an election and there hadn't been a crisis of 1848, he never would have been in power. And his, you know, his disastrous military performance in the Franco-Prussian War, you know, it shows us that historically sometimes people who have low EQ and low IQ can slip through the system if they got the right name. You know, it's sort of, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a political science historical thing. Um, uh, that you know, <clears throat> This is this is of course very personality dependent, but also it's a it's a disease of an authoritarian structure. Mm -hmm. you, see, you find the more authoritarian the regime is, the more likely the person at the top is to surround himself with the yes men, and and go off uh, on his own without any kind of uh, uh, good backup from people who know better. Sorry, may I may I uh, take that insight and turn it right away onto um, the twentieth uh, Congress in China and Xi Jinping? What I mean, what instinctively, um, both uh, Professor Camps and Ambassador Cosnet, what's your uh, gut feeling on how we should interpret the quality of decision making that would uh, come out of Beijing? And um, you know, I guess how you would model because right now we're we're in the pre we're in the pre war phase, the sort of the balancing phase, uh, the diplomatic phase of countries feeling out their interests. To try to create, um, uh, uh, try you know, essentially to create coalitions, uh, uh, should a blockade have to be imposed. So, ambassador, um, or, or yeah, ask sure, Gordon Chang, somebody, somebody who knows about China. I'm not a China expert. Sorry. Well, I'm not a China expert either, so uh, I won't I won't get too far out ahead of my skis. But I, I do have a couple thoughts about this. I mean, first is that, yeah, uh, I'm sure that the Chinese and the Taiwanese are watching very carefully what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. I mean, of course they are. Um, what is not as clear to me is what uh, what conclusions they are drawing from this. I mean, I, I, you know, if I were advising the Taiwanese, I would tell them, and again, they're probably, I think they're shrewd enough to have gotten there on their own, you know, to say uh, one of the lessons of Ukraine is the importance of national will, national morale, national mobilization, because it's not just the Ukrainian army that is defeating Russia, it is the Ukrainian people, okay? And they need to make sure that the people of Taiwan are fully engaged in this, you know, and fully fully committed to, um, to opposing uh, an attempt by China, you know, to retake the island by force. And then there are, you know, operational lessons they can learn about multi-layered air defense and that sort of thing. Uh, if the Chinese are paying close attention, I mean, I hope they're, I hope they have um, 
their ardor for an invasion has cooled. I mean, just looking at the logistical problems that Russia is having, you know, when they are, we're talking about a land operation against a country with the same rail, you know, the same rail system and all that. Whereas the Chinese are talking about attacking across, you know, over, I think it's a hundred miles of ocean. I mean, it's, it's a big chunk of ocean with naval systems that have not been tested. And, you know, um, when I talk to U.S. Navy officers, I mean, they take the Chinese threat seriously, but they will also talk about how there's more to building a Navy than just building ships. You know, the U.S. has been operating carrier task forces for a, something like a century now, and they sort of know how to do it, you know. Um, similarly, logistics is really, really hard. And you can look at other experiences of countries attempting an amphibious operation for the first time, uh, Turkey and Cyprus, 1974, for example, you know, and um, the first time you do, it's kind of a mess, you know, and um, I can imagine the, the Chinese getting an army ashore and then having a hell of a time keeping it supplied. Beyond that, I think the fact that um, the Western Europe and the United States and Korea uh, South Korea, you know, Japan, Australia, others um, have been quite serious about a sanctions regime, and there has been this kind of solidarity, you know, should be leading people in China to consider, are there better ways for us to continue to expand our wealth and influence other, you know, than some old fashioned grab for Taiwan. So I do think that the experience here should have made a, a war between China and Taiwan, you know, in the next decade, uh, less likely. But I may be wrong. And who knows, you know, what, um, you know, what China's leader uh, is really hearing and, you know, how, how permeable his bubble is. Okay, so forgive me for these, uh, these what may appear to be um, somewhat aggressive questions, but it's just, uh, uh, is to enable me to, uh, I guess, identify the contours of the process. So, uh, in in the the practice of, of diplomacy, let, you know, just focusing on on East Asia and around Taiwan, um, uh, what is the the human factor in Napoleonic games? You've got a core leader, and they, you know, the person's got a name and a history. You know, uh, 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 you know, Marshal Bernadotte. You know, he's good at some things and not good at other things, or Marshal Ney or whatever. Um, obviously, we can't replace um, diplomats with Zoom calls, right? You can't just have the American president Zoom calling Xi. Um, how uh, how do you uh, model capture the qualitative impact of the practice of diplomacy? I mean, of course, we again we have we have colorful descriptions of Metternich and Castlereagh and 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 you know Talleyrand interacting. Um, uh, what would you measure? And if you were to create a diplomatic game, um, or rather, a diplomatic simulation of of people trying to aggregate interests. You know, I, I think the big thing right now is Indonesia, right? The U.S. is trying to figure out how to engage with, with Indonesia. How would you measure that? How would you characterize it? I mean, when, when, you, when you come into a room with fellow diplomats, you must to your head go, okay, this is an agreeer person. This person is just a direct representation of the leader. Um, I'm not sure if that's a controversial question or... or uh, well, it's not, it's not controversial, but it, it is hard to answer. Uh, I, I think that um, okay. I am speaking to a professor of political science now, yes. and I will. Okay. I, I I got some bad news for you, Julian. Um, in my thirty-eight years as an American diplomat, and as as you know, someone with a political science degree, I cannot think of a single time when I looked to my political science background to inform my day-to-day -day work as a diplomat. Um, we have to do better. Well, I mean, that might've been a huge mistake. I mean, looking at some of the things I've been involved in, but I, 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 was always, I always felt more informed by history and by emphasis on the role of individuals, of individual leaders. And we've talked about that this evening in a couple of different ways, right? I mean, you know, Ghani versus Zelensky, for example, as types, if you flip them, what difference would it make? Uh, you know, we sometimes talk about uh, the grand scope of, uh, of economics, of political movements, and of course those things matter 
but you know the countries are and countries are not necessarily rational actors you know they are led by people who have dreams and and hopes and aspirations I and mean, look at what we were saying a minute ago about putin it, it may not have been you know rational for russia to invade ukraine but putin had his own reasons as an individual um so when a as a diplomat, I'm a big believer in Roger Fisher's book, Getting to Yes, and you know the importance of trying to understand what the person across the table is looking for, figuring out what are their core interests, what are our core interests, <laughs> where do they overlap. Um, you know, if you cannot come to an agreement uh, across a conference table, there may, may still be progress you can make. Uh, that will that will secure your interests. Now, as an American diplomat, uh, I think it's important that the United States, and we don't always get this right, and the last few years we haven't always gotten it right, that we remember that our job is not only to um, to seek to advance American interests in an economic or political way, but also to project American values that we need to be arguing for the things we claim to stand for democracy you know freedom rule of law and i was fortunate in um in, in my time as ambassador to kosovo my last assignment before i left federal service to be able to push peace justice prosperity these are things that were good for the us uh as we oh, attempt to maintain stability in the region and that at the same time we're good for the people of kosovo so as a diplomat you always have an easier chore if the people you're talking to are going to benefit from what you're pushing and you don't come across as if well you know this is good for my country so you know we're just going to twist your arm and expect you to do it well i've had um I, I, when i when i was abroad in in uh, high commissions in pakistan I very often had the experience of young um, uh, foreign service personnel mm -hmm. having the frustration that they're not out, they're not actually allowed to, in that, in that particular case, represent Canadian values. So, uh, you know, in Pakistan, you can't meet the, you know, the, the, the general and say congratulations on your latest attack. You have to bear their way of governance and just, you know, keep your mouth shut. And, you know, a lot of these young people expect to be able to uh, uh, you know, it, it do precisely what you said, which is represent values. But um, in 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 the act, they they're told to you know be quiet and let's just you know try to achieve the limited objectives that we're here to do. Which for Canada was you know trying to get supply lines into Afghanistan. Yeah, it's um it's frustrating. It's a slow process. I mean, one thing that has changed enormously in diplomacy since I started out is the role of public diplomacy. You know, uh, when I started out, it was foreign ministries talked to foreign ministries. If you were an embassy diplomat, you know, you might spend most of your time over at the foreign ministry trying to persuade them to do stuff. Now, we spend far more time talking to people outside of government, to students, to business organizations. Social media is very important. You still have to you still have to work with the host government. I mean that's critical. Um, you also talk to opposition political parties. That's part of the job, you know. Uh, and host governments don't always like that. I mean part of part of the problem that the United States has with um, with trying to build a global coalition against Russia now to um, you know to oppose its oper its actions in Ukraine is that over the past 20 years, I mean, the U.S. has, um, you know, we've given up some of the moral high ground and we've made a lot of questionable decisions. And if you look at attitudes in the Middle East, in Africa, in India, a lot of people say, oh, the Americans invade countries whenever the mood strikes them. You know, why should we get involved in some border war between two countries in Europe just because the Americans want us to? So, you know, we, we are reaping what we sowed to an extent. I think we're rebuilding some of that credibility now, but it, it's a long road. And um, I have suggested that the U.S. has to become better at practicing 
what I'm calling, I think I coined this term, uh, strategic humility. You know, what I mean by that is we need to pursue American goals. We need to push forward and without apology. And we should not be isolationist. But we also have to acknowledge we don't have all the answers. And in a country like Kosovo, which is struggling to build uh, a resilient democracy and doing a pretty good job of it, you know, I'd go on TV and talk about January 6th and so on and say, look, you know, the American democracy uh, project has been going on for more than 200 years and it's still not perfect. So we shouldn't expect you to be able to make it perfect in just a couple of years. And we have to work together to try to find the solutions. So if I may ask a much more specific set of questions, you know, g given the variables that you've identified because of your, 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 your privileged perspective, what is going on in Turkey, you know, a pivotal country? I mean, it, it seems to be playing a very salient role here in the war. Um, it, it's confusing to people because it, it, it did an abrupt shift, shift from secular to, I guess, more nationalist, uh, religious, cultural type of government. How do we understand what's going on in Turkey. And is this a temporary thing? Well, yeah, I think that um, it's a cliche to say that there are two Turkeys, that there is a Western oriented uh, Turkey of, you know, business people and, and elites who speak European languages. And then there is this other Turkey of you know, modestly educated village people for whom Islam is, is a driving force in their daily lives. In fact, it's not that black and white. I mean, there are plenty of, uh, of educated people who, for whom Islam is very important, for example. I think for a long time, lots of the, the so-called, you know, Western, Western oriented Turks, um, they acted as if Turkey was theirs and these these other people, you know, lived uh, lived under sufferance. I mean, in some ways, it, it it's not unlike the debate you get in the United States about coastal elites versus people in, you know, in the heartland. Uh, so it is understandable, I think, that smart Islamist politicians like Recep Tayyip Erdogan, you know, were able eventually uh, to come to power. Now, uh, Turkey is a democracy. It is an imperfect democracy. It is one where uh, the governing uh, the governing powers have a lot of tools at their disposal to make sure that the playing field is not level. Uh, yeah, uh, the one of the main opposition political figures, uh, I think it was Mayor of Istanbul, was just you know uh, prevented from running in the next election. There are uh, I think that, you know, Erdogan is going to do everything he can to maintain power. Uh, he's, things are kind of shaky because he, he built his, his, his power base largely, uh, by, through economic development, infrastructure projects that, uh, were on borrowed money and borrowed time. And now the economy is in very bad shape. So, you know, if there are free and fair elections in Turkey, the outcome is in doubt. Now, tying that to Turkey's role vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and Russia, you know, uh, some people think that Erdogan is pro-Putin. I don't believe that. I believe Erdogan is pro-Erdogan. I believe, don't think Turkey is pro-Russia. I mean, there's a lot of mistrust, and not just from hundreds of years of wars, but just from recent events. Um, at the same time, there is a lot of mistrust of the United States. An unfortunate number of Turks actually believe the U.S. was involved in the uh, attempted coup against the government of Turkey in 2016, which is simply not true, but partly because the spiritual leader of the organization, which was evidently behind the coup, uh, lives in exile in the United States. You know, that's enough just that alone is enough for a lot of people to believe the Americans at a minimum must have known that the coup was coming and decided, you know, to keep silent, you know, if not actively organizing it. I mean, none of that is true, but a lot of people believe that. Okay. Turkey, long before Erdogan came to power, uh, had a very talented diplomatic corps that knew how to use leverage. So, when Turkey decided that they would not um, 
automatically agree to Swedish and Finnish accession to NATO. I don't think that came as a surprise to Westerners who had dealt with Turkey. And in fact, if you look at the reaction from the State Department, from other Western foreign ministries, there wasn't much outrage about that. There wasn't, you know, there were no expressions of, oh, the Turks are, are betraying the alliance. They kind of says like, yeah, we kind of saw that coming. So, well, you know, we'll, you know, the bazaar is open and, and we'll see where this goes. Uh, I do not think that that reflects uh, a desire by Erdogan or by, by the Turkish people to see Russia prevail in the war. You know, Turkey has done a pretty good job of providing military support to Ukraine. At the same time, it has been politically opportunistic enough and economically opportunistic enough to, um, to allow its territory to be used and its banks to be used by Russian sanctions evaders. Now, okay, why is this happening? It's happening because uh, Turkey is playing all the angles and they will get the best that they can out of everybody. I do believe in the end, they will work a deal with the Finns and the Swedes and you know, with other NATO partners participating in the background and, uh, and Sweden and Finland will join the alliance. I mean, the fact that they have requested to already is, you know, is of enormous political impact. One last point I'll make here is that, you know, Erdogan has been instrumental in trying to broker a deal between Russia and Ukraine to permit grain exports uh, through the Black Sea, you know, uh, to the wider world. You know, he is not, I think he is primarily interested in that, not in a European context, but as part of his effort to establish Turkey, not just as a regional power, but as a global power. Yeah. And there are a lot of African and Middle Eastern bellies that are, um, you know, that are going to be full if this operation fully succeeds and Turkey's going to get and it's going to deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh, I mean, if, if uh, yeah, I, I think you can sort of anticipate the, um, I mean, thank you very much for that detailed um, analysis. Uh, I think you can appreciate the uh, sort of the immediate gut reaction of, of someone like myself, which is, are they still on our side? I mean, they, they, I, that's a horrible question to ask, but um, you know, with Spain, there's a bit more trust. So when they do something bad, which is tell the Catalonians, don't even think about independence, you know, we, we, we agree with them. Um, Sweden, I mean, even during the Cold War, they had secret arrangements with NATO regarding airfield use and shared intelligence. Turkey looks like it's drifting really far away. I mean, we have nuclear weapons, not we rather, yes, nuclear weapons in Cherlik. Um, and, you know, I understand it's not uh, all, you know, certainly all the Turkish, the Turks' fault. The Greeks and the Turks, once they joined NATO, seem to have thought they were free to, you know, uh, cause trouble with each other, which they were too afraid to do before they joined NATO. Um, but you know, the old, the old narrative, which is Turkey is just a a country in transition to becoming a liberal country, doesn't look like that anymore. It looks like they're they have a strong nationalist goal. They, they I think they flew their stealth airplane today. Um, why would Turkey need a stealth airplane? Um, and they've got a very sophisticated air defense system against who? Uh, sorry, and, and sorry, and just a tag, a tag question, which is you know the the big trigger. Ukraine thinks somehow it's going to take over Crimea. There must be some thought in Ankara about about this Ukrainian thing about okay, we're going to get Crimea, um, or or do the Turks have no comment at all? Uh, I mean, on on who takes well, Crimea? I think the the Turks are actually very sympathetic to. Um, to Ukraine's desire to retake the Crimea, in part because uh, the Russians have been very rough on the Crimean Tartars. That's a, you know, a Turkic minority group in Crimea that has longstanding ties to Turkey. So I think there is there is some sentimental as as well as you know real politic uh, views views on that in Ankara. I I do not think Turkey is. Okay, Turkey is a critical regional country. It is a critical NATO ally. You know, it is something you, you read commonly in fact sheets about US-Turkish relations is Turkey is a difficult ally. Yeah, it's true. And the Turks write the same thing about us, you know, that the US is a difficult ally. We have very serious differences on Syria policy, on, um, on, on how to define counterterrorism, 
you know, the, uh, I think that I was an American diplomat stationed in Turkey at the time of the attempted coup in 2016, and the Turks felt that the Americans were very slow to understand, you know, what an existential threat this was to Turkey. Now, uh, at the same time, our view was, and my personal view certainly is, that Erdogan used this coup attempt, which was a, a genuine you know, threat not just to his regime, but to Turkish democracy as an excuse to really run the table and arrest tens of thousands of people who had nothing to do with the coup, but he just wanted out of the way. And to fire, you know, many people, university rectors who had nothing to do with politics, but he just wanted it out of the way so he could, you know, strengthen his hand in the universities. Um, I, I think that there have been points where Erdogan has thought about leaving NATO or breaking with the Americans and realized that that's, that's a really scary prospect. You know, you're staring into the abyss and that being in NATO gives, um, gives Turkey leverage over Europe because decision-making in NATO is consensus-based that it would not otherwise have. You know, NATO is the main European plus plus institution that uh, of which Turkey is a member. So, uh, it would be crazy to leave. Again, I don't think that Turkey is pro-Russian or uh, or that it wants to strengthen its ties with the Gulf countries in a way which has to, in a zero-sum fashion, threaten the United States and Canada and the West. Um, it's going to continue to require a lot of management and sometimes hardball. I mean, there are times when both Russia and the United States have played real hardball with Turkey in recent years. You know, a couple of years ago, Turkey was involved in a totally misguided effort to influence the United States by, uh, by arresting and, and unreasonably detaining American citizens who were guilty of no crime. And, you know, we, we did not give in, we did not trade hostages, you know, we did not, um, we did not accede to their request that we cut corners uh, with our laws on extradition, okay. Uh, similarly, in 2015, Turkey shot down a Russian bomber that entered Turkish airspace, and Putin uh, launched a series of sanctions against Turkey, and eventually the Turks blinked, you know. Um, it is, it is, it may seem undiplomatic to talk this way about, you know, a, 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 an ally and a partner, but the Turks engage in very disciplined transactional diplomacy. And I think that we need to do the same thing. And, you know, we, we need to not, um, not evince outrage when Turkey or any other ally stands up for its interests, but we don't have to cave either. Well, if I could just uh, uh, shift one country over, because you served on the east and the west of Iran, uh, having been in Afghanistan and Iraq, and of course to the north in Uzbekistan. And right now there is a, uh, I guess, public disturbances. I'm not sure if they, we couldn't characterize them as, as insurgency, but you did mention public diplomacy. Um, from you know what we know, you know both both as you know political scientists and war gamers about supporting a social movement or an insurgency. What's happening? What do you think uh, is happening in Iran? Having seen a lot of these these um, uh, sort of hybrid semi-authoritarian states, and what do you think could be done? And also, how would we measure what's going on? I mean, if if we if if someone were to sort of plot a game and say, okay, we have public dis disturbances that could be political consequential uh, in Iran. What are we measuring and uh, how does it affect, I guess, the ultimate political system? Well, I think that it would be off the top of my head. I think that you, it would be worthwhile to model who the different actors are, you know, and what their specific interests are. Um, and that's something that, okay, it is not an insurgency, but, you know, one of the strong points of, of uh, the counterinsurgency series that GMT Games publishes is that they're multiplayer games 
and that highlight how the goals of the different players sometimes coincide and sometimes not. I mean, you know, in Afghanistan reality and in um, a distant play in the GMT coin game, you know, uh, it was clear that the government of the U.S., the government in Kabul and the, you know, regional the, the regional political leaders, a.k.a. warlords, did not have identical goals. Similarly, uh, I think that there are, you know, that there are ordinary citizens, uh, especially very brave women, you know, in the streets in Iran, uh, fighting for their rights and freedom. Are there other actors who would like to see the regime weakened who have other goals? I mean, those are the sorts of elements you need to look at. In terms of, uh, you touched, you used the phrase public diplomacy. I will say here what I said uh, to uh, another, another audience recently in the United States, that sometimes the hardest thing for Americans to do is nothing, you know? Uh, there are times when uh, an authoritarian regime will, will assert that its citizens who are standing up for themselves bravely, you know, are just tools of the great Satan. And uh, it doesn't help when the great Satan is tweeting about it all the time, you know, and sending in money via NGOs to help, help these people um, to demonstrate. I mean, sometimes it does, it is necessary. Um, sometimes it's better just to sit back and, you know, let other people plot their own course. No, I, no, I think you're quite right. I, I hadn't thought of that. My, my instinct is to do is, is to, uh, you know, do that one step more than George F. Kennan, which is always looking for a rollback. Um, but there, I mean, there was an instance where uh, the CIA thought they were going to send someone in during the Hungarian revolution and thought, you know what, much better just let things take a natural course, even if it does take 40 years, you know, the, the alternative being um, um, uh, a, a nuclear war. Uh, sorry, can I can I change um, focuses just not too long, but just briefly on Iceland? Because you must have had um, uh, you know perspective on on Arctic security, and I think you know the the rhetoric was um, I think it was uh, fisheries protection against uh, Chinese, and somehow the, somehow the Chinese were going to infiltrate into the Arctic, which uh, Aaron has kindly put on the map behind him. Um, uh, so uh, what's the reality of the Chinese working their way into the into the Arctic and um, the the sort of the climate change thing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is it real or is it rhetorical with regard to the to, to what you saw in Iceland? Okay, well, okay. Let's let's break this into pieces. Uh, so first of all, you know there is a cliche that the Chinese plan a century ahead. Uh, I actually think there is something to that. I and mean, when I when I served in Iceland, and this was from 2004 to 2006, there was quite a large Chinese embassy there. Um, and it wasn't clear that there was much Chinese economic activity. And, you know, there, there seemed to be more Chinese diplomats than were necessary to report, you know, on, on the Keplavik, you know, mayor's election and so on. And um, and I do remember one evening at a, a social event, you know, we don't spend all our time as diplomats at cocktail parties, um, but they do they do occur not when you're not in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I asked this Chinese diplomat, so what do you what are you guys doing? What, what are your interests here? What's your big pro presence about? And he'd had a couple of drinks and he said, oh, we're just waiting, you know, uh, until a time when they would get the call to do something. And in the years since then, there have been efforts by the Chinese to invest. Uh, there was uh, what passes for a notorious effort in Iceland for a, a Chinese, a so-called Chinese business person planned to set up an airport in Northern Iceland, ostensibly uh, to fly in golfers from China or some nonsense like that. And the Icelanders, not being idiots, you know, figured this cannot end well, and and they fended it off, you know. And fine, if the Chinese want to try to assert their influence around the world, you know, they they have a right to do that if it's done legally, uh, just like you know the U.S. and its Western allies have a right to oppose that. Um, when I served there, there, you know, we were just starting to talk about global warming and its effect on the Arctic. Uh, you could, 
see articles in Icelandic magazines with maps of how, you know, the ice, um, you know, the ice was going to weaken and the trade routes were going to shift north. And, you know, and uh, Reykjavik was, had the possibility of becoming a major transit port between Europe and North America for a few years, and then we'd all die, you know. So uh, it, it is not clear to me that uh, this desire for short-term economic advantage, you know, weighs uh, heavily on the minds of Icelanders. I think they are deeply concerned about uh, climate change, you know, and um, uh, have always been quite uh, focused on the environment because they live in a very fragile environment where even small changes could be very disruptive to their lives. Were there negotiations about uh, preserving fisheries or anything? I mean, I, I, don't, I, I really know very little about uh, Iceland, but I know that, again, speaking recently with uh, Professor Troy Buffar from Alaska, that there have been huge changes in where the fish are. Um, mm -hmm. Basically moving north um, uh, through the Bering Strait into the, into the Arctic. Were there uh, issues like that? Uh, that that's not something that I recall tracking at the time. I will say that uh, the U.S. Icelandic relationship, when I was there, was fixated on uh, on security, and you know, uh, and arranging a rather peaceable shutdown of the naval air station at Keplavik, which had played a critical role in anti-submarine warfare in the Atlantic, you know, since World War II. Uh, we had not seen any Nazi U-boats or Soviet submarines in a while. Uh, the presence at Keplovic uh, was cost half a billion dollars a year and 3,000 billets that the U.S. military thought could be put to better use. So um, we were able, fortunately, because at the time the Icelandic economy was doing exceedingly well, uh, the government there was willing to negotiate a base closure because you know, the, the economic, the loss of, 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 you know, local jobs and so on was, uh, was a cost that, you know, that they would be willing to pay. So um, I will say after the base closed, uh, the variety of issues that the United States and Iceland started thinking about really broadened. And there have been a number of areas of scientific cooperation, environmental cooperation. I mean, this is a whole different tangent. But I actually think that there are times when shutting down an American base uh, can actually improve relations with the host country. I mean, I think the case of the Philippines is instructive. For many years, uh, the, the presence of Clark uh, Clark Air Base and uh, you know and Subic Bay uh, Navy Base uh, was a real magnet for uh, for protest, and there were, there was a lot of resentment of the degree of extraterritoriality of these bases. And, you know, after they finally shut down, we were able to chart a new security cooperation, you know, with, with less baggage. I mean, there are other examples out there. Um, I could imagine a future where, uh, you know, the U.S. has fewer bases in a number of countries, but we still have the right uh negotiated you know right with the host government to operate out of there uh but having fewer american flags uh over the bases could actually improve relations with our allies well i think that that insight might be uh, very important i had seen on TikTok last week which was a, a replayed fox news story that uh vice president harris's visit to manila was actually to reopen bases um, because um, uh, the, the U.S. would have a difficult time protecting Taiwan without bases in the Philippines. Kyushu and Okinawa are too far away. But so, there's a difference between operating American bases and operating American forces on host country bases. Yeah, no, de definitely. I, I, you could sort of have a reforger model where you show up at the last moment. At least, at least the Chinese not being in Luzon. Um, you know, having political engagement. Uh, so may I, may I ask you about, uh, you know, the Balkan? I mean, holy cow. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, oh, sorry. Before he jumps off the Arctic, Please. can I jump in here real quick? Because um, I did put my, my map of the Arctic behind. Um, you know, your War in the Ice Game uh, ambassador is uh, very interesting. I almost bought a copy this summer from somebody who was trying to sell it to me for the, the low price of about $60. Right now, I think Board Game Geek has it for 70 so if you can find somebody to sell it, 
it's amazing how the prices on these have all gone up over the years. Um, I've used a couple of matrix games. Uh, I've, I'm, I'll send the links in the chat. One was called On Thin Ice, done by the Army War College. And then that's been updated recently to include a lot more Russian activity. And I was using it in a, in a grad school class to talk about um, transnational issues, everything from fisheries, as you mentioned, um, to oil rights, plus the military aspects of it. And um, I found my students had a really hard time wrapping their head around some of the issues, in particular, um, the fact that uh, when you're talking about climate change, we're talking about five or 10 year increments of time sometimes to see, you know, a substantive change in the ice. The way the, um, uh, the matrix games are designed, they're, they're, they're looking at five and 10 year increments. And, uh, you know, when you start talking about, well, this could happen in 30 or 40 years, the students, their eyes kind of roll around in their heads and they're going, oh my God, God, we have to worry about that. I said, yeah, once you get past about a certain number of years, I'm not going to be worried about this problem set anymore myself. Um, is there any way to kind of to, to be able to relate this to folks? Um, in particular, you know, dealing with grad school students who I'm trying to, to teach through using some of the games and courses um, about these problem sets, particularly ones that have long time horizons like this. Do you have any suggestions at all? Sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dennis, can you identify yourself uh, for the ambassador? Oh yeah, my, my name is Aaron Danis. I recently I recently retired from the intelligence community after about 38 years, plus I was uh, in army intelligence for a number of years. And I teach at Institute of World Politics in downtown DC. Now my last um, gig as it was when I was in the intel community was teaching at National Intelligence University in Bethesda. And as soon as I, I retired, I, I escaped DC. I now live in Delaware by the Delaware beaches. Um, anything to get out of the, uh, the ocean of taillights in Washington, DC. So um, uh, I, I still go back and I'm doing courses online and I still go back to run some games. And um, so a lot of this for me is just interest in, in dealing with graduate students who are going to be looking at these issues down the road, right? We're supposed to be training our replacements at this point uh, in the national security field. Uh, and I'm trying to help them learn lessons uh, uh, now through gaming that uh, we learned and a lot of times the hard way, 20 year war in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, you know, really leaves kind of a sour taste in your mouth. Um, maybe we can help them a little bit now, maybe using some of the gaming tools we have available to us. Well, let me turn the question back on you, Aaron, because you, you've clearly given this a lot more thought than I have. I mean, how would you approach it? Um, well, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, when I was talking to the students, you know, I tried to tell them right up front, you know, um, we're going to be talking in terms of five years, right? Oh, the game on thin ice, part of it is, is the students get to play representatives on the Arctic Council, right, which the leadership changes over I think every three years, two or th three years. And I said, we're gonna fudge it a little bit and we're gonna set it so the leadership changes over each game turn, which is about a five year game turn. And I, and I asked them, think back, where were you five years ago, 10 years ago? A lot of my students were in, were, you know, they were undergrad or they're in high school. And I said, these are the kind of time horizons you have to wrap your head around when you're talking about these problem sets you may not get immediate gratification if you're working one of these issues, if you're at the State Department or in the intelligence community or at the Department of Defense. You may be working a different account entirely because you'll probably change accounts through your career. So you, may, you have to have a kind of focus that you're trying to do a long-term good, that this is not just going to change things overnight, that this is a long, I said, even though, you know, we, Think back to the whole ozone crisis back in the was it the late 80s and early 1990s, right? There's going to be the huge hole in the ozone, and we were all going to fry um, from from the sun. And you know, it took years of negotiations to get agreements to get um, you know certain chemicals taken out of usage for refrigerants and things like that. So um, I, I try to tell them to think in those kind of long term. But we're, we live in a society where everybody. Um, has instant gratification. They want a TikTok video today 
uh, that tells them how to solve their problems. So it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to do. Sorry, may, may I jump in and just uh, I, on that timeline issue? I had compared uh, Japanese century planning from the the 1970s and 80s. And you know, ultimately, the Japanese couldn't predict their own economy. When I, when I look for long-term planning, I look at uh, the municipality of New York City, which is which built a tunnel looking ahead at water usage for 150 years. And this, it's an enormous tunnel that goes uh, up to the Catskills into the Adirondacks. So um, there are political organizations that actually have remarkably good ability to look ahead. I think it just might, might be very difficult on the national level to make those types of decisions. But this, the, the city of New York is, um, you know, they're elite. Right. So, so far, they've, they've uh, not been uh, proven wrong. Um, so uh, we have, we have uh, five minutes. So uh, can I ask? Sorry. Thanks. No, no, that's a, a very, very good, I mean, it's an excellent, excellent uh, discussion. Uh, obviously, climate change can have huge impact. Something I, I mentioned earlier, of course, about the, the, you know, California coming out of nowhere to now become an economic uh, superpower. Uh, so um, Ambassador Cosnet, I have political science students. We already know that you're advising them to do history, not political science. Um, I mean, Sorry. I, Ideally, they should do both. No, I don't think I don't think it's bad at all. I, I did political science and history as my my undergraduate double major. Certainly, uh, you know, I encountered a, a political scientist in my class at Columbia. I'm not going to say which elite school he came from, but when asked by the professor about the dates for the First World War, he said, oh, I don't do dates. I'm a political scientist. So definitely, <laughs> we, there are some basics that we should know. What advice can you give? Um, the I mean, the overwhelming number of students that I get, and I'm sure uh, Danis gets as well are you know um, international development people international human rights people and then people who want to join the foreign service and, and most of the time I, you know I, I advise my students it's a very difficult life especially if you're doing human rights or development it's a very difficult way to get a paying job a lot of NGOs now if you want to become a foreign service officer and join um, international affairs very often you're going to have people telling you what to do and you, you're, you're not a revolutionary you're not going to tell uh, the government you're going to what you really think I mean ob obviously and most at least in, in the case of Canada, our, our prestige locations are Washington, and those people are trade economists, you know, they're not human rights people. So it's a very, very technical field as well. What advice would you give uh, young people who are starting their academic path on the types of skills they should pick up uh, to, to, you know, be most effective uh, working as um, a diplomat? Okay. Um, lots of economics, for one thing. You know, I wish I had studied a lot more economics than I did in college. Uh, what I, I usually tell people in their 20s or 30s uh, who are toying with a diplomatic career in government, you know, with joining the Foreign Service of the United States or, um, or another Western country, I, yeah, give it a shot. I mean, and do two tours. I mean, yeah, it's a competitive process, but if you get in, do two tours because the first country you serve in, uh, your, your level of satisfaction with the tour may depend on the country, the culture, uh, the people you work with, whether your boss is a jerk or not. You know, after two separate tours in two different countries, you should have more of a sense of whether the, the work is uh, interesting to you and it fits with your it fits with your family's needs if you have a family or just your personal needs because people without families are people too. And I tell people, if you decide it's not for you, then move on, do something else. It will look good on your resume. You will have learned something and it will be good for the foreign service as an institution to have another person on the outside, you know, whether at a bank or at a, um, or writing for Saturday night live, you know, who knows something about how diplomacy works. Um, it is a bureaucracy and it, you know, it takes a while to move up the ladder. Not everyone is comfortable with that life. I, when I joined, I didn't particularly plan on spending three and three plus decades in the foreign service, but it kept being interesting and enriching. And, you know, uh, and, and they kept giving me opportunities I couldn't say no to. And my wife worked in development and sometimes she was able to work uh, in the same country as me which was uh, what we liked and sometimes not. It's very, it is very tough on two career families. Uh, it can be a great life for kids. You know, they'll complain about moving all the time, but 
uh, they'll look back on it, realizing what a special opportunity it is. Certainly my kids uh, found it enormously broadening and uh, expanding of their worldview to to see the world. And, um, and they're grateful now for those opportunities. Uh, it is not the priesthood. It is also not just a job. It is a profession. You know, it's somewhere in the middle of a life calling and just a job. Um, but I, I think that uh, it is a tremendous opportunity to serve your country, to also, uh, you know, to learn cultures, to learn languages. Everybody joins for a combination of selfless service and personal goals, and they find their own equilibrium. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Cosnett, particularly, and, and you, you know, you anticipated the question, which is how do people squared away with their personal lives? So, I, you know, again, thank you uh, on behalf of Concordia University and uh, the SDS for sharing uh, your, you know, professional experience, your experience as a war gamer, and uh, even if it didn't help that much, your experience and your knowledge as a political scientist. We look forward to uh, playing your game Vengeance. And, and I mean, frankly, um, I'm expecting to see many other titles as well after that. So thank you very much. Thank you all. It's been a great pleasure. Take care.